Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 LSI Wood Protection Plant Operator Seminar. My name is Grady Bradford. I'm the Industrial Sales Director for LSI Wood Protection, <clears throat> and I will be today's uh, moderator. Behind the scene are Belinda Rimley and Sarah Fonts, who are controlling the seminar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to assist in making today's event simple. I would like to say that we are having some issues with people getting on board. Uh, so they will be joining as the day goes on. Uh, this is an example of the attendee interface. You should see something similar on your own computer desktop on the upper right corner. The audio defaults to your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio panel and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to the presenter by typing into the questions pane of the control panel which you may send at any time during the presentation. We will monitor the questions and present them to the speaker as they come in. Additionally, this year we have added poll questions as many states require proof of engagement from the audience. You are required to answer the poll questions scattered periodically throughout the seminar. Each is one question and should only take 30 seconds to answer. If you do not answer, we will not be able to confirm with the states that you were engaged and fully participated in the seminar. Sarah will be uh, handling this part of the presentation. Some states also require a final exam that must be passed with at least 70% correct. We will email you the exam if your state requires it. Please take the test and submit it immediately. Thank you. I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, <clears throat> Eric Loomis. Eric will be speaking with us about the LSI Wood Protection New Ownership Update. Eric is the Director for Commercial Operations for LSI Wood Protection. He has 15 years of experience in wood protection preservation business in research and development, manufacturing production, and now sales. Eric has a BS in chemical engineering from Auburn University and is an active member of the American Wood Protection Association and the Western Wood Preservers Institute. Eric, welcome. Thanks, Grady. Um, So just uh, gonna repeat a little bit of what Grady said to uh, start with. Um, like to welcome everyone you know, to the seminar. And um, for those who don't know me, Eric Loomis, Director of Commercial Operations for the, the Wood Group in North America. Um, appreciate everyone joining us um, early in the morning and hope that we can uh, make this content as um, exciting as it can be while also you know, meeting the credit guidelines. Um, for those that have been here before, you'll see some similar content, uh, but understand that those are things that we have to do in order to get credits. Um, with that being said, um, if you want to hear something, learn about something, other ideas, topics, please submit those um, as part of the, um, you know, the, the review forms or the comments, um, critiques. Um, some of our content, some of our, um, you know, discussions have come from this. Uh, you know, commentary before, and so um, we'd love to hear that. Whether we can do it or not, that depends on whether we can get credits, but um, your ideas would, would help us with that. Um, other thing, wanna, there's a lot of uh, work to organize this event and wanted to, um, you know, thank all the presenters for their time to, um, you know, taking the time and uh, putting that together. And then specifically behind the scenes, Sarah and Belinda, Grady, Grady mentioned that, but you know, really want to thank them for their efforts. Um, understand that there's a, a lot of time and 
effort behind the scenes in order to set up these credits, not only for me, but for, you know, but for you and um, the, the um, attendees. So uh, thank them when you get a chance and, and I personally thank them. Um, uh, Grady asked me to uh, speak a little bit about um, the, the new ownership and um, uh, if, if you're not aware, hopefully you are, but um, you know, the um, Lonza um, sold to a private equity of Bain Capital and Sinvin. Um, this was announced in February and completed um, in July. Um, so we're, we're going through that uh, changeover process um, right now. Um, we're currently, our official name or well, our name right now is LSI Wood Protection. Um, we expect uh, um, some information related to, to new name and new branding to come out shortly, probably within the next couple weeks. Um, but you know, with that, the, specifically the, the wood group, the chemical division, um, the, the people um, running the business, the people that you see every day, your sales reps are you know, still the same. Um, our business is operating the same and our, our new ownership is um, excited to be part of the wood group, um, excited to, you know, to grow the business um, and, and we're excited to you know, continue on. Um, not expecting any any major changes uh, for those uh, for those customers on the lines. When when we do uh, you know change things, um, we'll have the proper communication. Um, but again, at, at this point in time, it's you know business as usual for us, and should be business as usual um, for for you as well. Um, if you have any specific questions, feel free to you know reach out to your sales rep or reach out to me, and I'm more than happy to you know to answer what I can. Um, but, but again, this is something that we've been preparing for for a couple years, as it was announced uh, several, or, you know, a couple years ago, um, and we're going through that process now, and um, should have some finality here, you know, here shortly. And um, again, finality just in naming and, you know, what the procedures are moving forward. But you know, business as usual for everything else. Um, again, um, if anyone has any questions or want to, you know, speak to me offline, I'm, you know, think for the people who know me, feel free to call me. I'm, I'm an open door and will answer, you know, answer what I can. Um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Grady and hope everyone uh, enjoys the seminar. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Jeff Miller, who will be giving us a report from the Treated Wood Council. Jeff has served as president and executive director of the TWC since 2003, where he focuses on government affairs, financial growth and management, membership growth, and much more. Jeff earned his BS in chemical engineering from the University of Notre Dame. Sorry about that football game this weekend there, Jeff. Uh, his MS in civil en environmental engineering from the State University of New York at Buffalo and his MBA uh, management, Farley Dickinson University. Jeff, you're on. Grady, thank you. Let me just uh, start and, and explain a little bit about the Treated Wood Council and who we are and how we got started. And what we do, um, I want to spend a minute here just to thank Eric and Grady, uh, Sarah and Belinda for inviting me to be on to this uh, program. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get out and, and, uh, and interact with the treaters. Um, many of you are members of our association and, and quite frankly, we couldn't do what we do without you. So a big thanks goes out to all of the treaters out there, all of you who support the Treated Wood Council, who uh, enable us to do what we do and to, and to give you a chance to, uh, um, to work with the government. And our job is to, uh, we are the interfacing group between you and the government entities. We try to make your job easier. We try to make your job less expensive. Uh, we try to expand the uses of Treated Wood products so that you can sell more of your products to, to the customers and the consumers out there. Uh, just a little bit of history here. Uh, the idea of the Treated Wood Council started in 2002. It extended through 2003 
Um, there were about 20 organizations at that time who all got together and said, we need a treated wood council. We need an organization who's going to uh, contact EPA when there's a regulation being proposed, who's going to deal with state legislative bodies and Congress when they want to propose a new law uh, or a new statute that will affect our industry. Uh, we also deal with the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the state DOTs, uh, all of those entities who in and of themselves issue or regulate this issue regulations or regulate this industry insofar as a government affairs standpoint um, they are critical to what you do they're critical to what we do as a whole industry our task is to is to protect those uses and to expand them through government relations activities as i said before when we got started in 2003 there were three major components the treaters the um, lumber product suppliers, and then the preservative suppliers. So uh, we may have probably all three on this call in one uh, a form or fashion, whatever, in, in whatever format. Uh, one of those was, of course, Arch, or at that time, Arch, and then Lanza, now LSI. Uh, and we, of course, thank them. We thank those who started this organization. We have grown uh, in the course of a matter of, uh, almost 20 years now uh, to over 520 member organizations and that includes 185 treaters 121 lumber or pole or tie providers 11 chemical suppliers and then almost 200 associate customer or association members sometimes it's hard for us to put a dollar value on the kind of work that we do. So in this next slide, I've tried to do that. This is a regulation and I'll just simply say it's a financial assurance regulation. We put a dollar value on it for you, the treaters of about $20,000 a year. And we think that's the savings that this regulation or the lack of this regulation has benefited the, the treater industry out there. So if you have more than one treating plant, um, the chances are this is a very sizable annual savings that we provided for you. Financial assurance was a regulation that was proposed by EPA. Um, our uh, industry coalition led by TWC had meetings with EPA, we did studies, um, the result would have been either a mandatory uh, $2 million trust fund, naming EPA as a beneficiary, or the purchasing of, a light, of an insurance policy uh, worth $2 million that again would name EPA as a, as a beneficiary, which would go to EPA if any event would happen where you would have to close down. Um, that has not generally happened, but if this regulation went into effect, the result would have been a, an expenditure for each of your treating plants out there of, in the area of $20,000 a year. Um, our industry is no longer in the target group of uh, industry sectors who are targeted for financial assurance regulations. So that's a result of the work that we've done and a result of the support that you have given us to, to allow us to con continue to educate EPA and communicate with them, at least on this particular uh, regulatory proposal. I'm gonna go through some other uh, regulatory options, uh, regulatory issues. That's kind of small print. Let me see, is there a way to, I think that's a little bit bigger. Um, the two issues at EPA that, that, that the Treated Wood Council has been involved with, with EPA, one is a, we abbreviate it by saying NESHAP, uh, it's N-E-S-H-A-P, it's the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. If you are a treater of arsenic, as in the case of CCA or ACZA, then this would affect you. Uh, EPA has been sued on this standard. 
Uh, we have engaged in EPA with EPA on its its review and its regulatory uh, consequences. Um, at this point in time, um, we think we're going to avoid any future regulations that would impact CCA or ACZA treaters. Um, and the re net result would be um, uh, fewer environmental emission control requirements for you as a CCA or ACZA treater. This is an ongoing operation with EPA and we expect proposed rules to come out next year in 2022. So be on guard for those. Uh, some of you get an email from me every morning. Uh, if, you, if you're a member of TWC and you do not, let me know. We can add you to that email list. Those emails are very short, they're very specific. They're very easy to read and understand, and it gives you a way to keep yourself up to speed on all the issues that are going on that TWC is handling with respect to EPA or all the other government entities out there that we deal with. The next one on this list is a guidance document that EPA has already put out. Um, it is for stormwater discharges from either sawmills or from wood preservation facilities. Again, we have submitted comments to EPA. They, have, they understand those. Um, the consequence would be, uh, if they were negative, they would be more discharge control measures that would have to go into place, more monitoring requirements. Um, our uh, suggestions to them have been supported by other government, uh, other uh, industry sectors that we have worked in coalition with. Um, so the net result of this guidance is, is a positive result. Uh, for many of you, you have state stormwater discharge permits, and this is the guidance that is used to uh, implement those permits and to uh, make regulations and performance requirements for you, the treaters. Our next slide talks about uh, a new rule that EPA is proposing just this year. It came out in March and it has to do with performance requirements for pesticidal claims. So if you are selling or distributing a treated wood product, if part of that marketing effort is to claim pesticidal controls, then EPA has proposed certain standards that have to be met. Uh, we submitted comments working with our members back in May. We had a meeting with EPA last month. The consequence of this is gonna be higher costs, higher costs for you, the operators uh, of these uh, preservatives and the treaters of these preservatives, higher costs for the purchasing of, of those chemicals. Um, our meetings with EPA have been positive. Uh, they, they are learning more about treated wood probably than they've ever had before, and probably more than they've received from other pesticidal products. Uh, but it allows us to keep them informed, keep them educated, and make, make for better rules and better rulemaking, uh, a better rulemaking process with respect to EPA. I'm continuing on the federal regulatory area here. Uh, there are two on this slide. One is the, we call it the NHSM rule. That stands for non-hazardous secondary materials. Uh, this is a rulemaking process that we've gone through by way of a petition with EPA. And what we've asked EPA through the petition is to allow treated wood biomass. For instance, the material that is used for, for decking or for fencing uh, or for a gazebo, um, all of that treated wood is treated with a non-hazardous preservative. At the end of its useful life, we would like EPA to list this type of material as a biomass that's eligible to be a boiler fuel. It changes the entire paradigm of what treated wood is all about. At the end of its life, we want it to be a fuel and a resource 
rather than a waste. Uh, we expect some rulemaking to come out on this uh, in another couple of months. Uh, I, uh, I'm hopeful that EPA will rule in our favor on this one, uh, but it's gonna continue a long road toward communicating and, ed and educating EPA. The last one on this sheet is a um, air standard, a maximum air contaminant uh, control technology standard for plywood emissions, but it includes kiln emissions from lumber kilns, uh, if you're out there, if you have tree, if you have sawmill operations, or if you're um, doing uh, kiln dried after treatment, then this particular standard uh, will affect you. Uh, our negotiations with EPA again have been positive, and we are pushing them toward management standards rather than engineering controls. Engineering controls would mean you put a stack. You put a capturing device at the end of a, uh, or all around your kiln, you capture all of those emissions, you treat them. Um, that's the last thing we would want. Um, but these things can be controlled. The emissions can be controlled simply by management standards, such as careful monitoring, good record keeping, uh, reactions to things that are going wrong, like, like uh, a fan that will be not operating correctly, um, uh, or other devices that, that are part of the kiln operations. Next on the list is the re-registration of tebuconazole. Um, many of you use tebuconazole containing wood preservatives to treat wood. Um, EPA has published in May of this year a draft human health ecological risk assessment for tebuconazole. We have found errors in their calculations, have submitted comments to those errors um, back in August, two months ago, and we continue to follow up with EPA in that regard. The consequence of this would be far more extensive uh, worker protection measures that you would have to institute in your treating plants um, should this re-registration of tebuconazole uh, go sour. We don't anticipate that to happen. Before I go on to the next slide, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a totally new measure that has come out. Uh, we just heard about it last week. It's, there is an EPA rule that we call the treated article exemption rule. I don't have a slide for this, uh, because it just came out last week prior to these slides being produced. Um, there's a current rule under the pesticide statute that says that once you treat a piece of wood, it becomes a treated article. And that treated article is exempt from regulations under the pesticide statute. EPA has reported, this is the EPA under the new administration, EPA has reported at an industry trade show and conference that they are going to examine the treated article exemptions under the Toxic Substances Control Act. This is different than the Pesticide Act. Our concern is if they propose it for one, they can very easily propose it for pesticides. This would allow EPA to regulate our products until they're used, until they're collected at the end of their life, until they're disposed of. In some cases, this could mean, in, in the worst case scenario, could mean uh, extended uh, manufacturer responsibility. And this is a, a policy that's caught on in Europe, it's a policy that is in effect in California for some products. It's a policy that would make you, the producer of treated wood items, responsible for their use, disposal, collection, all the way through their entire lifespan. We don't want that. We want to maintain the treated article exemption for pesticide products. And this is a key issue that, that you're going to hear more about in the future. Corps of Engineers 
Um, I'm gonna go through the next couple of these slides very quickly. We've engaged the Corps of Engineers in um, half a dozen different states. We've reversed bans on the use of treated wood in California and Missouri and, uh, uh, and five other states. We're currently active in four states in commenting on permits there. Uh, the net gain on this whole thing is we're allowing more treated wood to be used under Corps of Engineers permits throughout this country. Congressional action. We started a program back in 2009. It has extended um, until now and it will continue. I've listed a few of the companies out uh, on the screen that have participated in this program. Uh, it is a way to invite members of Congress and their staffs into your facilities educate them about our processes, our products, the impact we have on local communities. This has been a very successful program for us. It will continue much stronger after this entire COVID um, uh, scare has been neutralized. I will point out just one that came up to us last week. Uh, you'll see on the screen, Central Nebraska Wood Treating. Uh, we invited a member of Congress in to visit them several years ago. Um, that member, uh, Adrian Smith is his name, was so impressed with the facility, the operations, the impact on the local community that tomorrow he is coming back to visit that plant. He is bringing his entire Nebraska staff and he is bringing his entire Washington DC staff to come and visit that facility. Um, it, it's a great opportunity to educate people who are lawmakers who are regulators, bring them in, uh, give them a taste of what we are, um, how many people we employ, how many families we support, the kind of local community impact that we have. And we turn around and use that relationship then uh, when it comes to congressional action or even regulatory action. I'm gonna kick to a couple of international issues very briefly. In Canada, uh, there's a environmental assessment going on with respect to copper. Uh, the good news is that the wood trading industry is not on the targeted list in Canada for this assessment. It's more in terms of smelters and major manufacturing facilities, but this is the kind of an assessment that we keep an eye on because whatever happens in Canada is gonna be used by EPA to support whatever they want to do with respect to copper and copper products. And many of you treat with a copper-based wood preservative. Also, there's an international assessment going on with respect to treated wood utility poles. It started as an anti-wood drive. Um, your own uh, Tim Carey has been the vice chairman of a work group there with SIGRI. And I'm proud to say that we have reverse the entire thrust of this drive and made it into an educational effort for utility companies. A um, couple of state activities in New York State, there's proposals to, um, uh, to regulate uh, the use of pesticides for remedial application for poles. Uh, in Florida, there's legislation that would give a dollar value relief to ex-employees of wood treating facilities. Uh, both of these have gone nowhere, but we've helped to educate the lawmakers in those two states. And lastly, just this year in 2021, there's, I, I'm gonna take a, there's 20 states listed on there, maybe 15 who have introduced legislation to ban neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, that would include the wood preservative imidacloprid, which is a, con uh, a component of several of your wood preservative products. Um, we're happy to say, we're very pleased to say that all of them have been either reversed or killed or amended so that they don't have those um, negative proposals against treated wood products. And you all are familiar, I think, with our program to educate state DOTs, state parks officials on their own 
treated wood specifications. Again, there's 20 or so states on there that we've been involved with for the past year. Uh, just three more slides. Um, we just completed earlier this year a guardrail crash test. This is for CCA treated guardrail posts and blocks. It was a very successful crash test. It shows that a certain type and design of a treated wood post assembly has been successful in deterring a negative crash uh, on a, along a highway. The consequence of all this is that now we can change state DOT regulations to allow the use the implementation of these particular post and block assemblies for use on highways and, and, and therefore the more sale, uh, more of a sale of these products, these posts and blocks in our highway systems. I do want to thank all of the treaters out there who helped fund this effort. Uh, it was a special fund provided for by the, uh, <clears throat> by the treaters of guardrail posts and blocks. We have a new category of treaters, uh, of members. It's a major customer category. Um, currently we have Lowe's, um, 84 Lumber who are members, several utilities, several railroad companies who are members. Uh, we like to have major members come in, uh, help guide us with respect to the use of those products in the field uh, or the sale of those products at big box retail stores. And the last slide, um, just want to announce that on November 18th and 19th, we will be having our 2021, that should say 2021, not 2020. Uh, annual meeting, Government Affairs Committee, it'll be in Alexandria, Virginia at the Embassy Suites Hotel. Uh, we thank um, all of you for registering to come to that. If you haven't yet registered, I will tell you that the room block at the Embassy Suites is shrinking. Um, if you wait too much longer, um, you may have to be looking for a, a hotel room in a different location. We don't want you there. We want you at this meeting in this hotel. Uh, that's where you interact with other treaters. That's where you get to hear speakers from EPA and other federal agencies and get a firsthand view of, of what's going on from the, from the government affairs arena. Um, again, for all of you members, thank you again for your support. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Please send in your questions if you have any. Uh, our next speaker is Micah Jaynes, <clears throat> and his topic is Common Enemies of Wood and How to Protect It. Micah is a technical sales and service rep with LSI. He has been in the wood protection business for more than 18 years with positions of increasing responsibility, beginning as pilot plant technician, and most recently, handling sales and technical services. Micah has a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Georgia State University. He is a member of the American Wood Protection Association and also serves on T7 uh, Technical Committee. Micah, welcome. Thanks, Grady, appreciate it. Um, just a correction, I don't serve on the committee anymore, but no worries. Um, this is just a brief overview of the common enemies of wood and protecting it. Um, we could probably talk all day on just fungi. So um, remember all materials have enemies. You can have spalling concrete, um, corroding metal, and of course wood decays. Uh, so when you talk about biological or non-biological attack, uh, those two versions, uh, spe specifically non-biological deterioration and degradation, we, we just are on mechanical damage, uh, weathering, UV and moisture, and chemical and damage, chemical and heat damage, which is uh, less likely. But so when you talk about me mechanical damage, it's just weathering or um, erosion, right? Uh, 
wind, waves, rain. Cleaning and traffic are probably the most common. Um, remove sound or degraded wood fibers, leaving it uneven, uh, prevented by mechanical barriers, really. It's the only way to, to, to prevent that. Um, this is an example of UV weathering. Um, you see the gray appearance of wood. Um, underneath, it's, it's, it's fine, but it just distorts the, the color. And with moisture and other things, you get checking and cracking sometimes. Oh, sorry. With moisture problems, like I said, dimensional change, which gives you warping, bowing, checking, splitting, things like that. Um, the main way to reduce that is uh, we have water repellent to apply in the preservative solutions or surface coatings as in deck staining and water repellents. Chemicals again not as big of an issue but alkalis can degrade lignin, the wood becomes fibrous, uh, acids degrade cellulose, wood becomes brittle, um, really prevented only by uh, more resistant wood or other materials external barrier. Uh, heat, decomposition begins above 100 C and combustion above 275. Uh, the difference there, you can actually reduce the 275 C combustion temperature with exposure, sorry, a long exposure over 100 C. Uh, typically that's not seen, but um, you know, you have a color change and strength loss uh, prevented by fire retardant treatments or external thermal barriers. So possible causes of biological deterioration, um, fungi, insects, and marine borers are the main, main ones we, you know, uh, are preventing using preservatives. Uh, but just a brief uh, mention of the other bacteria, birds, and animals, I, I do mention too, but so first off, fungi. I'm sure we've all seen decaying wood in the in the woods, or you know, possibly on a on a structure. When we talk about fungi, we're really talking about in this presentation. I'm talking about wood decay fungi and non-decaying fungi of mold, mildew, and sap stains. Uh, those are the ones we are trying to prevent. There's so many others, um, of course, um, mushrooms and such, but we're just referring to those those specific ones for preservative uh, treatment, you know, and 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 keeping them away. Uh, decay fungi. There's four main things they need to sustain themselves. Of course, food, moisture, oxygen, and a suitable temperature. When we treat the lumber, we take away food as, uh, sorry, we take away the, the wood as the food. Um, so that's the whole point. If you see the wood decay fungi, uh, the only part you're seeing is the fruiting, fruiting body. That's the part that uh, releases the spores, which is part of its reproduction, right? It's trying to, uh, you know, put its spores out so it can infect, you know, affect other other wood. The destructive part, the main part, you know, we, we are concerned with is those microscopic filaments called hyphae. They grow kind of like roots um, throughout the cells. Um, these, this part of the fungi actually excretes chemicals cellulase or other compounds and it digests the wood. It breaks it down so the fungi can absorb the nutrients. Um, specifically aggressive copper tolerant fungi excrete uh, oxalic acid, which then converts the poisonous part of the copper, the copper compounds that we utilize for preservatives into copper oxalate. Um, copper oxalate is not harmful to them, so then they can continue to grow and digest the wood and absorb it. 
there's an electron micrograph of a healthy cells of a cross section of a piece of wood. That's where we get the, the sound, the structure, right? The, uh, the strength of the wood is by those, those tubes. And you can see after fungal attack, it's almost completely gone. That's why we lose strength and structure of the piece of wood. We talk about rot, decay, rot. There's three main types, brown, white, and soft. Brown rot, it attacks the cellulose, which turns it darker brown with a kind of a check cross grain pattern. Uh, it actually can crumble real easily, almost into dust. Um, predominantly in softwoods, uh, you get faster weight and strength losses with this one. White rot attacks mainly the lignin, which is the glue that holds the fibers together, turns wood white and fibrous. Uh, a lot of times in the woods, you kick a log or something, it'll be kind of white and fibrous. That's typically that, predominant in hardwoods, slower but more complete weight loss. And soft rot, right, just to mention, attacks all components, um, but really is limited to the surface. Uh, it, it darkens the wood and becomes soft, and it's usually in conjunction with another type. So it's not as uh, significant as the others. When we talk about mold and mildew, it's really just a, a surface um, aesthetic issue. Um, and health issue if someone's sensitive to the spores. Uh, we, we utilize chemicals to reduce or eliminate the uh, germination of the mold so it can't grow, um, which then keeps it nice and clean for the lumber yards to sell to consumers. Um, it's basically everywhere. Even the air we're breathing now has mold spores in it most likely. Um, the pigmented hyphae, I mean, the pigmented hyphae or spores, uh, that's usually what you see, um, just, just feeds off the surface nutrients, knots, uh, sap, uh, sap on the, uh, wood is more common to see mold start growing around. It doesn't affect the strength of the wood typically. And then sap stains, very similar, causes that discoloration may be unpleasant or um, people don't like it, you can use uh, anti-sap stains before the material is cut and produced into lumber um, to keep it nice and bright and yellow. But it grows through the sap wood of, of just about anything, has the pigmented high feet as you see there in the picture. Um, it just consumes, uses food stored in the cells it doesn't affect the strength. Uh, it actually can aid in penetration of preservative on um, harder to treat species if they're really um, infested with the blue stain. It can grow through the pits between the cells allowing preservative into the wood. Um, that's interesting. So protecting against the fungi, right? Uh, just eliminate one of the four things it needs. Um, there's an example of saturated wood um, in those pictures. It reduces the oxygen, it can't grow. Apply heat, um, dry it to less than 20%, or of course, pressure treatment. Wood destroying insects. Uh, again, there's some others out, but we just look at these specific to the treated wood industry. Termites live in structured colonies, consume wood and live in it and include, uh, the galleries include frass. This is, looks like sawdust. Um, unlike carpenter ants and bees, it's usually clean galleries, um, but everybody's seen these, I'm sure. Uh, we utilize the chemicals and preservative products to prevent them from 
um, continuing. But in certain circumstances, unfortunately, this is a piece of treated wood. It was actually in a pack of lumber uh, on a yard and noticed, someone noticed um, termites. Uh, the only explanation, it looked when we did our analysis that there was untreated wood in the inside of this wide board. And I think it was a two by 10. And apparently they survived through the treating process and then just continued to grow. Um, very interesting. Uh, the only time I've ever seen this though. Termite hazards, of course, in the Southeast and the lower Southern West, Western coast, you have very heavy, um, you know, termites are, are prevalent. Um, moderate to heavy further north, slight to moderate, and then none to slight. I believe that's one of the reasons why up north you can have permanent wood foundations or basement foundations, wood, wood foundations and basements. So, Carpenter bees and ants uh, use wood for shelter, um, and the galleries are typically clean. I'm sure we've all seen the uh, carpenter ant um, on the bottom right versus the uh, the bumblebee, but that's just a picture. Um, and the left picture of carpenter ants, they're actually in my front yard. I've never seen red and black ones until um, I moved here. Typically, you see black carpenter ants, so that was interesting. And they're aggressive boogers. Um, they'll, they'll, they're quick to bite, but they keep the fire ants away. So I've not messed with them. Beetles, um, ambrosia beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, powder post beetles. Uh, we typically don't see the attack in treated wood, but sometimes it happens. Uh, usually it's in untreated, but. Um, Ambrosia beetles can attack freshly treated wood. Um, you can see their typical galleries that is kind of like perpendicular. They move in and then and then sideways. Bupressed beetles, a metallic wood boring beetle. They're small, but they could do damage to forests um, like other metallic beetles. Um, The new house bore can survive pressure treatment. Again, haven't seen this personally, um, but it's a you know it's definitely an enemy. Powder post beetles. You see that typical um, there the the holes, multiple holes in the in the piece of wood. That's a piece of oak. Um, I believe that's what I've got actually in my willow furniture out front. I just treated with some permethrin, so hopefully I took care of those. Um, of course, pressure treating would, would help, um, but that furniture is not pressure treated. Prevention, again, chemical treatments, preservatives, pressure treatment containing insecticides. Uh, again, you can help with ponder sprinkling, keeps them too wet for them, or an actual uh, coating, painting, or heat treatments, which is required for export. Marine borers, shipworms, folids, limnoria. There's some examples of the picture there. Um, they're getting a little more prevalent in the coastal waters we've seen. Shipworms, long translucent worm-like mollusks found in the waters. Um, they use wood for food. So as long as it's treated, you usually don't have to worry about those. Um, the openings, are uh, are interesting. They're coated, I think, with calcium carbonate. It's just a white coating, uh, different from the folids, which is the next one. They don't have any uh, coating on the opening of the hole, so you can kind of tell which one was was the cause of the attack. Clam-like mollusks found in coastal waters. They use food for uh, use wood for shelter only. Um, they'll actually 
bore into the wood and then filter feed. Um, they can actually bore into other substrates than just wood, but uh, the chemical doesn't really uh, deter them. And the biggest thing I've seen is they may introduce an opening into uh, like a piece of piling if the chemical strength is low or non-existent in the interior close to the heartwood the uh, shipworms will actually infest through an opening of a folid if they're dead and gone the shipworms can get in there and they move up and down where the folids are just uh, you know straight from the side into the piece of material limnoria a uh, pill bug-like gribbles crustacean found in all waters uh coastal waters use wood for shelter and food uh it gives you that typical hourglass pattern if anybody's seen that um on piling prevention cca acza creosote or dual treatment or a physical barrier an actual wrap like you see in the picture there or coating um, that's they cannot attach to. Uh, that's one of the pre uh, preventatives. Bacteria, again, just briefly, it slowly degrades wood, uh, typically saturated wood. Um, sap wood is most susceptible. And the biggest thing, it can help aid in fungal attack. And birds and livestock can damage treated material even still um, cribbing and stuff that, that cows and horses do or or of course humans and that's it thank you thank you micah be sure to send in your questions if you have any. Our next speaker is going to be Tim Carey. And Tim will be talking about using preservatives to protect wood, the second part of this presentation. I would also like to remind everyone that at the end of Tim's presentation, there will be a poll question. And for those whose states require that, you'll be sure to take that. It's only about 30 seconds to answer it. Tim's done, <clears throat> Tim is the LSI's industrial sales specialist and has been with Lonza since 1996. He provides support to customers, manufacturing, and users in all areas of treated wood, including production, quality, process, and proper end use. Along with serving customers, Tim has had several articles published in technical journals and serves as the industrial representative for SIGRA. He is active with many industry associations such as AWPA, SFPA, TWC, and ANSI. Tim received his undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia and his BA in management from Georgia State University. And I believe that SFPA should have been SPTA, Southern Press Trade Association. Tim, welcome. All right, Grady, thank you. So we've heard Micah talk about all the issues, and so now we're going to try to talk about what we can do to uh, protect our wood products. Um, why wood? One thing, we've got the sustainability that wood offers, and treated wood is scientifically tailored for its final application. Think about the various retention levels that you're treating to based on where the wood is placed. And that's all controlled by geography, species, what kind of exposure hazards, and then the final end use that the wood's gonna be used for. As Micah said, alternative materials also have their issues everywhere from concrete, fiberglass, aluminum, steel, and even underground can have failures due to attack. But wood, if it's treated properly for its application, it's easy to install and use. It's versatile. And obviously, you guys know the performance features include its durable strength to weight, provides insulation, resistance, resistance to wind, and treated wood enhances the durability and performance in each of these applications. 
some of the early efforts to try to protect wood go back into the 1800s where they used to try to soak wood in such fun things as mercury chloride and copper sulfate. Then they tried the, in the Burnett process, which included the uh, impregnation with zinc chloride, uh, and then pressing freshly cut trees into uh, treating solutions so that hopefully they would, uh, as the moisture left, new treating solution would go into them. And then, but with all these things, it just was never very successful at protecting wood like it should be. So then we get into 1830s and the Bethel process comes along, which is where you use initial vacuum to remove air and open up the cells to allow for treatments to get into the wood. And in those days, the main thing was an oil treatment, which was coal tar, as in from creosote. And then in 1883, Bolton added a, step, a seasoning step, which is boltonizing, where you actually heat the wood up in the preservative while pulling a vacuum to allow it to boil off the water to make it easier to treat. Then the industry itself started taking off in the early 1900s as different types of uh, treating processes were developed and then people were wanting to know, well, hey, how do we make sure we get things done properly? So then you had the AWPA, which came into existence in 1904, and the U.S. Forest Products Lab at, at uh, Wisconsin was come, came out in 1910, where they could do testing of treated wood products in various environments and applications. And as most of you are aware, there's a lot of different preservatives out there. Oil-borne types are everything from creosote, penna, copper naphthenate, copper eight to now DCOI is one of the newest ones, waterborne's. CCA, ACZA, ACQ, the copper azole family of both dissolved and micronized. Then you have the metal free type products and there's other things that people are always looking at. Creosote was kind of the backbone of everything since it was used for railroad industry and ties uh, and it's continued to be used today, especially in the United States as the main tie wood tie treatment. Although other preservers are being looked at in special applications. One of the things that's being also offered now is the inclusion of boron, either as a one-step process, including it in the creosote, or as a two-step process where you pre-coat or pre-dip in boron type solutions to get it in there prior to treating it with creosote. Pentachlorophenol has been around a long time. It started off as a soil sterilant uh, in agricultural uh, arena uh, became um, a wood determined to become a wood pesticide preservative. It's been used for poles, cross arms, some piling and some bridge timbers, and it has ground contact and freshwater use. But it has been decided that it will no longer be manufactured. At the end of this year or into the first quarter of next year, there's still some some fluctuation in that, but it will be going away. Other Oil-borne type products, or you have your copper naphthenate, which has been around a long time, is used both in pressure treatment as well as surface applications. Uh, DCOI is probably the newest one that's out there, and you can see why they call it DCOI because nobody can pronounce its name. You have copper eight, which has been around a long time. It's a uh, oxine copper. Uh, one of its advantages is that it can actually be used to treat wood like in crates that are gonna come in direct contact with food products. Uh, CCAC, uh, it's been around a long time. Sometimes people forget that it has been because uh, it was developed in the 30s in India. Uh, it's, been, it's a restricted use pesticide. It's been heavily used since the 1940s and really took off in the 1970s with the uh, implementation of backyard decks and then from there into the pole industry because of uh, the oil embargo. So uh, it's, it continues to, to be used here, although it's been restricted or banned in some countries, while it's still dominant in a lot of others. And, and most uses are poles, piles, agricultural posts and timbers, and it can be used in marine environments, which is a, a strong use for it. ACZA is another waterborne preservative. It's an ammoniacal type preservative in that the metals are dissolved in, in an ammonia and then placed into water. Uh, it was originally developed uh, out in California back in the 20s uh, as ACA, 
In the 1980s, they cut the arsenic in half and replaced it with zinc. Uh, one of the nice things about it as a, as a product is that you can actually add borates to it. It's been used mostly for difficult to treat species such as Douglas fir and hardwoods. Uh, and it can also be used in uh, salt water, which makes it very useful. And it's been used for marine piling, poles, dug fur, ties, piers, agricultural posts, laminated materials. It also has had some, it has some fire retardancy to it, as well as uh, some woodpecker resistance from testing that's been done in the past. Uh, ACQ was probably one of the first of the uh, residential type waterborne preservatives that was used after uh, CCA was removed from the residential market. Um, as you can see, it was originally patented by Stella Jones. It's an unclassified or, or pesticide, but at the moment it's currently not available uh, simply because of the quat compounds that are being used for other things involving the COVID. Uh, copper azol. It started off as a dissolved product developed by Hickson uh, and, this, and then became, there are now micronized versions of it. There's both B and C. Uh, the difference is C has two azoles in it while the B only has one. And once again, it's an unclassified preservative. Uh, then you have your meta-free categories such as PTI, SBX, EL2, uh, you can see what their breakdowns are. They're mostly all for above ground or interior use, uh, not really for uh, any kind of ground talk, contact whatsoever. Some of the other ones out there, Copper HDO, KDS, and KDS Type B, these products are, are still trying to find their way into the market. Um, once again, it's just other, other options that are uh, unclassified. Treatment additives. Sometimes it, you need something else to uh, go against things other than just wood decay. As Michael was talking about molds and stuff in his talk, moldicides can be incorporated into most all of these products. In some cases, people are looking for colorants because they want a more permanent color to it. So you can have pigments and dyes that can be done either prior to uh, pressure treatment or after. Uh, we also, there are penetration enhancers that help you to uh, get deeper into the wood. Uh, and then other just things that help the treating process, such as defoamers that keep it so that it stays in solution and stays as a real liquid rather than a foam. Uh, corrosion inhibitors. Some of these products have some corrosion issues, and so you can add that to them. But once again, there's pre stains. You've got water repellents to help reduce shrinking and swelling, like Mike had mentioned earlier. Uh, and then there are surface treatments that can be applied prior at the uh, sawmill or the pole peeling operations to extend the life of the wood without having attack prior to pressure treatment being used. Oh, the regulation of preservatives. So this is how it breaks, breaks down. You have your restricted use, your general use or unclassified. Most of us have always heard the term general use, but the technical term is unclassified according to EPA. So anyway, so then it comes out that those are the uh, end uses, but this gives you a breakdown of what falls into what category. And determination of a pesticide classification. This one always is kind of interesting to me was we refer to an RUP, which is a uh, restricted use pesticide or as most of us have gone through training on, on CPLs, when you see RUP, you're thinking of ready to use. But um, obviously all of our products are come as concentrates for you to blend and mix with water or whatever. Um, but everything has to be indicated. There's criteria that are set up in government standards so you know where it falls into, whether it's restricted use or not. Uh, and the other main important thing is that restricted use pesticides are not available for use or purchase by anyone without a pesticide applicator license. So, and typically they're all, they're sold in bulk rather than in small containers like most of the pesticides you see at a Home Depot, Lowe's or, or hardware store. Certified applicators. Well, that's why we're all here, right? To make sure we maintain our, app, our certified ourselves as certified applicators and whether if you're performing and using 
or supervising people in restricted use pesticides, you must have someone certified. And EPA sets the minimum for competency, but certification is completed at the state level, which all of you know, and that's why we're, we have this class approved in the number of states, wherever we have people that need it so that you can maintain your credit there. And uh, as you know, you have to have ongoing training and, and exams, and we're offering that today to make sure you guys stay up to date. And um, EPA oversees these state programs to make sure that they do cover a certain amount of criteria. Excuse me, Tim? Yes, ma'am. Could I just remind all everyone in the audience that currently have license or are expecting to get a license, if they would please send me a copy of their license so that we can keep that on our files as well, because we do need to have that proof of license. Right. If nothing else, if you don't have Sarah's address, make sure you email it to your sales rep and then he can get that to Sarah. That's a good way to uh, make sure he has it and she has it. But otherwise, Sarah, do you want to give them your email address? Yes, everyone should have it, but it is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H dot C as in Charlie, L-O-N as in Nancy, T as in Thomas, Z as in Zebra at lonza.com. All right, thank you. So guys, yeah, make sure you've got that information into Sarah so we can make sure we can continue to sell to you restricted use pesticides. So here we're gonna talk a little bit about pesticides in general. And a, a pesticide is anything intended to prevent, preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating a pest. You know, it's one of the things I like to tell people is I'm licensed to kill pests in seven states, so don't bug me. Uh, it's always one of those fun things to do at parties. But anyway, uh, it's also there are areas of plant regulators, defoliants or desiccants are also fall into pesticides as well as a nitrogen stabilizer. But some of the things we don't think about that, that have pesticides in them, probably the one I always look at is toothpaste, sodium fluoride in there. Back in the day when I did ground line inspection and treatment of utility poles, I treated a lot of wood poles with sodium fluoride. So it attacks tooth decay. It also attacks wood decay. Just something to think about. Um, and here's the toxic categories and their signal words. Obviously, as you can tell, category one is the worst. It has danger. You got warning, you got caution, and then also category four, which is non-required. And here's your toxicity exposures, whether it's acute, oral, dermal, inhalation, that's the main thing for showing in this category, so it's gotta be acute or it's a primary, or it may cause dermal sensitization. sensitization. Um, and here you go. This gives you the breakdown of where the, what it has to meet to fall into each of the categories. And here's an example of a restricted use pesticide label. Uh, this one is, is for CCA. And as you can see, it says danger and it says that it's a poison, which we all know. And understand in this case, we're talking about the 60% concentrate, which is a lot stronger than what we deal with in treating solutions. So thankfully, the way things are set up, you should never come in contact with the concentrate. At least that's the hope because it goes straight from our tankers into your tanks. But you can see on the side all the different things it's going to have on there, the, the, the signal words, what PPE, what safety requirements, environmental hazards it could be, first aid, directions for use, then storage and disposal. Now here's one for uh, unclassified. As you can see, it still maintains a danger level, but that's because it's a concentrate. Once again, it gets reduced to uh, with water before it goes into the wood. And it has the same types of things again about, it does not have an RUP statement, but it does have signal words and PPE and other requirements that you would need to know what to do with that product. So how do we limit the exposure to the environment and people? First is we have engineering controls. That's, that's your main way of doing that. Then you have safe handling procedures. You have containment so it doesn't get away from your site or out of an area that can be controlled. Housekeeping, keeping your plant clean. 
That is one of the things that will help you if an estate inspector comes in. If your plant looks clean, that's a box they can check off and move on to something else. And then PPE is technically the last thing that you should have to worry about. You should be, if all these other things in there, you don't need as much PPE, but PPE does protect you on a personal level and that's why it's important. Engineering controls that have been established. Uh, this is mostly for the industrial preservatives like CCA and ACZA, Penn and Creosote. There's the purge. And then for all products, the final vacuum. And it's based on total vacuum, which is minutes times inches of vacuum. So that your final vacuum must exceed your total initial vacuum. So their hope is that you will have pulled out more than when you opened it up, then left in there. That's free, that reduces the amount of free preservative in the wood. Uh, we, we all know about moving away from bolt-on doors to uh, automatic doors, which keep people away from the doors and not using the uh, nut drivers and different things to open and close them. Uh, the requirements for the uh, drip pad, the door pit requirements, um, how to maintain and handle the opening of doors, and how treated materials are moved. Uh, it used to be you could handle the bridge rails now they must be placed mechanically so these are things that have been enacted to help protect your your people on site and obviously in today's plants we do automation so you don't have to worry about turning valves and other things that may put you in more of an opportunity for exposure to preservatives uh, safe handling section on here, this tells you what to do with a restricted use pesticide, uh, storage and disposal. Obviously, you don't want it on food, water. A container for disposal, how long it can be on the pad, what you have to do, how to get rid of it once you've filled up that container. Here's a section that's on PPE, the things you have to wear in, in what proximity to the treating plant and treating cylinder. And one of the things that we came up with a few years ago, we always have done a calendar, but we decided to make it more useful in that, and that's why it's now called the EH&S calendar. Please make sure you have one, and if you don't have one, the new one obviously for 2022 will be coming out before too long, but let your sales rep know about it because some of the important things about this is that there are stickers on there that help you line out when you need to do certain things, whether it be federal or state requirements, such as reporting things. So you can place those on your calendar as a, as a physical means of reminder of things you need to do. So I know that everybody gets one. What I don't know is if it always trickles down into the actual treating plant where it's useful. So if you're not getting it, please let your sales rep know so we can make sure that we can get you one directly to you. Excuse me, Tim, we have a question from the audience. Okay. For bolt on doors, is it required on all chemical treatments to go to auto doors? No, if it's, if it's a uh, general use pesticide, you technically don't have to do it, but it's still a good practice and procedure just because it's it's just safer that way. But you do not. If you are treating, you do not. But it's much faster with quick opening doors than it is with bolt-on doors, if you've ever had to do bolt-on doors. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. um, the other thing that, that you need to be aware of and make sure you talk with your sales guys about is when things come in, make sure that people verify orders because sometimes people order things they shouldn't be ordering for applications where they should not be. And so this is important to have discussions and make sure your salespeople are aware of the things that need to be done with various treaty wood products, where it can be used, where it can't be used. CCA is very limited now and where it can be used in various things. So we need to make sure that everything is done according to what's the best possible use when you take an order. Uh, one of the things if you haven't been a part of, or hopefully you've listened to, or obviously have copies of their standards is the American Wood Protection Association. Uh, 
As I mentioned earlier, it was founded in 1904. It's been accredited by ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. Uh, there are memberships based on consumers, end users, government, academia, specifiers, and producers. Uh, it's an open technical process that's continually reviewed for making sure it meets consensus. And the different types of standards that it puts together are the ones for preservatives, the analytical methods to determine whether it's treated well or not, inspection requirements and quality control procedures that you as a plant need to make use of, and it has the evaluation standards for new preservatives as they come into the, to being. Excuse me, Tim, we have another question from the audience. Uh-huh. Is it planned or considered a substitute for CCA in the near future? Um, at this point in time, there's there's not a need to. I mean, there's always we're you know I'm sure like everybody we're always making sure and looking and seeing what we have. But at this point in time, it's very hard to replace CCA because it's so effective and it's it's so compared to the other things lo lower cost. You get a lot more bang for your buck with CCA. So at this point in time. As long as we can continue to use it for the applications we have, we're going to continue to support those uses. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Anyway, this kind of shows you here how the AWPA works. You have a, a committees that work under parliamentary procedures. There's voice votes. There's actual written balance after it's done. You have public review, and then you have to review, uh, resolve any negative votes. So. Um, Anyway, and then you got to get committee approval for active ingredients, carriers, any kind of properties, its treatability, its performance data, its effect on physical properties such as strength. And then every five years, every preservative has to be reevaluated to make sure that it's still performing as it, sh as it should be or, has, or how it was indicated when it was first approved. And these are the various committees. You have the preservative committees. You can see the, the types of things that it, that it covers. The P1 and T1 are oversight committees. And so it's made up of the officers of the other committees that are under its jurisdiction. So you have P committees, you have T committees, then you have the special committees where they do research. You talk about treated with use and plan operations. As part of the standardization process, you have to have New preservatives have to meet certain criteria, including termite resistance, there are field stakes in various parts of the country. You have L joints, which are just above the ground. You have soil block tests, which are one of the initial tests done to determine if something should be a preservative. You have ground proximity tests, which are close to the ground, but not in the ground, uh, and then horizontal lap joints. So there's a lot of testing that goes into approving a wood preservative. And AWPA controls all of that. Um, this gives you an idea, as you may, as you notice on your, especially on lumber tags and things, you'll see use categories, you see something, and this is the breakdown. You have UC1, which is interior, UC2, interior, but may get wet. UC3 is above ground exterior, like decking. UC4 is ground contact. UC5 is marine. And then UCF is the special category for fire retardants. So, and now there's a talk about possibly adding another use category, and that's for preservatives that don't have termiticide properties. So we're going to see if that happens, but it was first mentioned this past week at the uh, AWPA technical committee meetings. And that's kind of it, unless there's more questions. Thank you guys for being here. Um, like I said, you can always reach out to me, send me an email or whatever. I'm tim.carry at lonza.com. Um, but yeah. All right, Grady, it's back to you, I guess. Looks that way, Tim. Thank you. Uh, first poll question, number one. Yes, everyone, please get ready to take the poll, number one. If you are requesting CEU credits, you have to submit an answer to comply with state guidelines.
Okay, it looks like we're at 100%. Thank you. I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you, Sarah. Well, it looks like we're running way ahead of schedule. Um, like about 40 minutes. So, uh, Belinda, do you want Gian to go ahead and give his, or do you want to go just take a break? Let's go ahead and take a break now, and we'll if we stay ahead, we'll stay ahead, and then we'll take a little bit longer of a lunch break today. Okay. It looks like it's 9.20. Why don't we come back at 9.40 and continue the morning session? 9.40 Eastern Time. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, everybody.
Okay, uh, I have 940 here on my computer. Why don't we proceed um, with uh, the next speaker, and that's Gian Wang, who's going to talk to us about wood preservative treating science. Uh, Gian is a senior research scientist with LSI, where he puts his expertise to use designing, scheduling, and executing new products or processes for engineered wood and other products. Gian collaborates with industry partners to commercialize products invented in the lab or develop new commercial products. He independently designed, planned, and conducted research to synthesize or formulate adhesives for making wood composites and performed evaluation in accordance with ASTM for other test methods. Gian has his MS in wood science from Oregon State University and his ME in applied chemistry and BE in polymer materials from Dalen University of Technology. He has several published journal articles and holds three patents. Welcome, Gian. So good morning, everyone. So welcome to this seminar. Today, I will talk about uh, the fundamental wood structures and uh, how liquid flow in wood. Uh, we know wood includes softwood and hardwood. The wood cell and the interconnection in hardwood is more complicated than softwood. To make it simple today, I will, my talk will be focused on softwood. So we, as known, wood is a highly porous material, but it's not very permeable. So why? I, I hope uh, my talk today can help you find, find the answer. My talk today will cover these four parts. Firstly, I will talk about how tree grows and the wood anatomy, including a macroscopic and a microscopic uh, anatomy. Then I will talk about the liquid flow mechanism and how liquid flow in wood. The last part is about how to improve liquid flow in wood. So like uh, all living things, trees also has a life cycle like from seed to sprout, uh, to juvenile, to mature, to all the trees, finally to death. The life cycle of a tree depends on the wood species and the location. When people talk about the wood, uh, sometimes we may want to uh, discuss the juvenile wood. So juvenile wood is the wood like formed in the earlier five to 10 years. Uh, it's uh, in the, eventually it will turn to hardwood. In a young tree, the juvenile wood can be found from the top to the bottom of the tree in the center of the tree. But in an older tree, you can find the juvenile wood on the top of the tree. So generally, juvenile wood is regarded as a low quality wood because of its low uh, density, low strength, and uh, greater longitudinal shrinkage. So if we cut down a tree, look at the, the top of a stump, then we can see the macroscopic structure of a tree. So the very outer layer is the bark. It protects the wood from the extreme temperature. The second layer is phloem. Phloem um, can conduct the sugar and the nutrition from leaves to other part of the tree. The next thin layer is called cambium. Cambium actually is a reproductive layer it can generate the tissue to phloem and uh, sapwood. Sapwood uh, is, is a new, it's kind of like the water pipe in the tree. It can conduct the water and the nutrition from the root to the leaves. 
as the new rings of sapwood are laid down, the inner cell starts to lose vitality and then turn to hardwood. Uh, hardwood is not like sapwood. Hardwood cannot conduct water well because the cells are clogged with resin, gums, or extractives, and also the uh, also because of the peat closer. We will talk. I will talk about it later. But such hardwood can provide a strength support for a tree. You can also see these lines from the piece to the bark. We call it a wreath. Wreaths can are also the wood cells. They can uh, carry the nutrition through the wood. Another obvious thing you can see here is growth rings. Growth ring includes um, early wood and uh, and late wood. Early wood is the wood uh, formed in the beginning of the gr growing season, and later wood formed later in the growing season. Later wood is denser and darker than the earlier wood. Uh, so that's why the growth ring is visible. So early wood uh, generally, the red small picture is uh, about the early wood and the late wood. The earlier wood generally has a relatively large and thin walled cell. Late wood has a relatively small and thick walled cell. So before we move to the microscopic structure of wood, wood cell, wood cell, we it's very important to know the green directions. Uh, Wood has three directions, it's three important directions, longitudinal, radial, and the tangential. The longitudinal direction actually is the direction of the trunk from the bottom to the top of the tree. The radial surface actually is a vertical surface from the piece to the bark. A uh, tangential surface actually is perpendicular to the direction of rays and the tangential to the growth rings. These three directions are very important because the, um, the following microscopic uh, and anatomy and uh, the liquid flow parts in that in those that two parts, they are all they are all based on we will talk about them based on these three directions. So please keep these three directions in mind. So this is a picture about the microscopic uh, structure of wood. We can still see the three directions here. This, uh, this long tube-shaped structure is called the resin canal. And we also can also see the earlier wood and the late wood based on the thickness of, you can tell they are different by the thickness of the cell walls. In the radial wall, we can see more piece here. And also, we can also see the uh, cells in the red direction. On the tangential walls, we can see the the number of the piece is significantly less than that on the radial walls. Cell types. Uh, basically, there are three types of cells based on their length. Uh, tricky parenchyma and epithelial cells. Longi uh, you can find the, all these three types of cells uh, in the longitudinal directions or the redirection or the radial directions. Longitudinal tricky actually comprise uh, about 95 or more the volume of soft wood. And the parenchyma cell is shorter than tricky. And uh, the, the re tricky is significantly shorter than the longitudinal tricky. So, uh, and, uh, but the re tricky had a thicker cell wall, and the, the re parenchyma actually, the, the, the cell wall is thinner than the re tricky. Uh, the, you saw the resin canal in the last slide actually, they were formed by the epithelial cells. 
And in this structure, in this picture, you can see these dots on the ridge. Tricky is actually they are they are the the, the piece that are very important wood structure. We I will talk about in the next slide. Uh, there are two, basically there are two types of piece, uh, simple pit and the border pit. Picture A is a simple pit and B and C, both of them belong to border pit. And the uh, picture C is also called half border pit. In a simple pit, it actually the, the width of the cavity and the thickness of the pit memory keep consistent. In a border, in a border, the in a border the pit, you see the the cavity narrows towards the inner space of the wood cell, and the central part of the pit membrane is thickened. We call it a torus. The torus is surrounded by a delicate margin. In a half border the pit, we only can see uh, a pair of the borders and the thickness of the pit memory uh, doesn't change. And uh, you can find the simple pit on the re parenchyma and the uh, border the piece, you can see a lot of border the piece on the trickies. Uh, so half border piece, you can find the half border pit in the cross sections of the longitudinal tricky and the re parenchyma because on the re parenchyma is simple pit and in the on the longitudinal cell is a border piece so in the cross section of them they form the half border pit uh, i said the pits are very important uh, structure in wood so i include more pictures about this structure so this is the views uh, from the inside of cell, wood of cell. So it looks like a disc. So it's um, it's it's size about uh, size about uh, ten microns. And if you cut it in half, you can see the thick and central part called the towers. The delicate the margin around the towers we call it as margo. You see, the, compared to the towers, we can imagine that the water should be easier to flow through the margo than the towers. Flow mechanism. Uh, I will talk about three flow mechanism, diffusion, capillary action, and the back flow. Diffusion is a uh, gradual movement of the concentration uh, is um, the driving forces for this candle for this magnesium is the uh, concentration gradient, uh, the partial water vapor pressure and uh, chemical potentials. So this uh, diffusion is the dominant uh, magnesium for uh, treating green wood. Capillary action. Capillary action is the uh, uh, the ability of water to travel against the gravity in a small space. Uh, it's very it's a very essential transport of uh, it's very essential way to transport the water in the plant. So how how it happens when the water gets into the plant stem? We can actually, we can see two interactions. One is called the cohesion, the other is adhesion. Cohesion is the interaction between the water molecules. So they make the water kind of sticky to let the water molecules stay together. But we know wood also contains the cellulose. There is the, when water gets into the wood cell, the water molecule can be extracted to the cell wall, attracted to the cellulose. So when the adhesion is stronger than the cohesion, one water molecule will be pulled up by the cell wall 
then because of the cohesion, other adjoining water molecules will move up with this molecule. And then because of the surface, surface tension, the, the, liquid, the, the liquid layer will move up to keep it intact. The capillary action is highly dependent on the surface tension of the liquid and the gravity. So the smaller the diameter of the tube, the higher the, mood, the water can move up. You can see the difference of the, li the liquid levels in, in these glass wires. So in the impregnation of wood with non-pressure method, diffusion and the capillary actions are, domi are dominant mechanism. The last one is the, the bulk flow. Bulk flow happens that because of the pressure of difference. You see its uh, flow rate is proportional to the pressure, the pressure difference. And also the, the length of the structure can impact the flow rate. The longer the structure, the slow, the slower the flow rate. In the impregnation of wood with pressure treatment, this is the dominant flow mechanism. So uh, the next I will talk about how liquid flow, after we know this flow mechanism, I will talk about how liquid flow in wood. So, and uh, the factors impact, impacting the liquid flow in wood. Firstly, I would like to make clear two conceptions, permeability and uh, treatability. Some people think these two words are interchangeable, but actually there are still some difference between them. Permeability is a measure to see how easy the liquid can flow through wood. Treatability is to see how the liquid can penetrate in wood and stay there to achieve a desired retention. So there's, they are actually are not the same. We can still see some difference of them. So how liquid flow in wood? In the longitudinal direction, we talk about there are longitudinal tricky and the resin canals. Water can just flow through these two structures, through the wood in the longitudinal direction. And uh, between the two longitudinal trickies, we can find the border piece there. When water flows through this pit, you see the water can actually get around the center towers, then goes through the marble, then get into the another wood cell. So, so if we say the longitudinal, longitudinal uh, tricky uh, the water pipeline in wood piece can be regarded as the valves. We, we, we hope that the valves can be open so the, the water can flow through it. In the radial direction, similar to the longitudinal direction, the water can flow through the resin canals, uh, parenchyma, and the, the piece. But the Red canals actually, is, you see, its diameter is much bigger than the trick, uh, than the parenchyma or tricky. But uh, sometimes the red canal is clogged with the resin, so its flow rate is not always high. In the tangential direction, the water can flow by the piece and through by both tangential pitting or the cross-feed pitting. The cross-feed pitting actually I just mentioned in the slide about the piece. It happens at the intersection of the, the wood cells in the radial direction and the longitudinal directions. So uh, from this picture, we can also see that this is the early wood. The right one is the late wood. In early wood, we can see more piece than late wood. And also the diameter of this piece is larger than that in the late wood. 
so that's why in the so that's why in the uh green wood you actually is the water can flow through uh the earlier wood easier than the late wood okay the next important thing with is the very important conception called the peat aspiration uh, i said the piece um kind of the uh, kind of like the valves in the water pipe and when the <coughs> wood is dried or when the wood turns into hard wood there will be a pressure difference between the two adjacent wood cells so when water moves through the pit the surface tension of the water will push or will make the towers this pit membrane shift to the to the opening then finally it will seal the, this opening and uh, after the opening is sealed you can mean the water cannot flow through it easily water can also go through it by diffusion the water flow rate will be significantly reduced so what's the factor controlling this peat aspiration There are several factors. The first is the surface tension of the liquid in wood. Uh, the higher the tension force, the more pit will be closed. Uh, if some, someone ever replaced the water with other solvent with a lower tension force in wood, they found that the pit aspiration can be reduced with that the low retention, lower tension force liquid. The second is the stiffness of the pit member, membrane. So it makes sense that if the if the pit membrane is hard and uh, is if it's thick and uh, stiffer, it's harder to ch to change to change it to shift it to the opening of the wood cells. So the stiffer the membrane, the harder to aspirate the pit, and the the last factor is the adhesion. Some people believe the hydrogen bond, the towers and the pit uh, border, they can form the hydrogen bonding. This hydrogen bonding is kind of like adhesion to let the towers stay with the pit border. So how pit aspiration can affect the, the liquid flow in wood? Uh, in we found that the liquid flow in sap wood is better than that in the hard wood. That's the reason I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. That's because the closure of the piece and also the resin extractives uh, clogged in the wood cells in hard wood. So when we compare the late wood and early wood, so if the wood is in green condition, the flow in early wood should be better than that in later wood but uh, but when we treat wood we want to use the cune dry wood so after wood is dried actually the flow in later wood is better than early wood that's because uh, later wood we said later wood has a thicker cell wall so when the peat aspiration happened the thicker wall wall can um, provide the the higher resistance so that means it needs a higher force to close the piece in late wood so people uh I, pe so the piece in the late wood uh it's harder for them to be closed than earlier wood so in the dry wood then people found that it's easier actually it's easier for liquid flow through later wood than earlier wood also, we would we don't want to dry the wood too much because the old piece will be closed, then that will significantly affect the liquid flow in wood. Besides the uh, peat aspiration, we also need to think about uh, the liquid properties that can impact the liquid flow. The first thing is the viscosity. Viscosity can be impacted by the chemical properties, uh, temperature. Uh, also the concentration 
uh, all these factors can impact the viscosity and also the surface tension. I mentioned that the, oops, the surface tension can affect the pit aspiration and also the contaminants in the liquid. We don't want to include too much particulates uh, in the liquid. Also the attractives uh, and uh, the gases that can occupy the voids in wood. So will impact the liquid flow in wood. So how can we improve the liquid flow in wood? Uh, the, the first thing is that choose the easier wood to treat. That uh, this, uh, I found a paper that this paper compare this wood by treating the hardwood with the aqueous preservative then they separate this wood into four categories. Extremely difficult to treat, difficult to treat, uh, moderately easy to treat, and easy to treat. So find the wood that is more easily treated can improve the liquid flow in wood. And then but we can also do other things. The first is that we want to dry the wood to a certain moisture content range. Uh, because when wood uh, is dried to about the fiber saturation point, the piece, the border of the peat, the border of the piece in the wood will be significantly closed because of the peat aspiration. So we don't want, we don't want uh, use green wood because green, in green wood there's less voids available for the liquid, but we don't want to use over dried wood. So, so we hope to, we would like to dry wood to a certain moisture range. And then we would like to filter the solution periodically to remove the impurity of particulates in the solution and use up the old solution with the full cell treatments and the trial alterations in the treating schedule can also help the liquid flow in wood. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gian. If anybody has any questions, please let me know. Our next speaker. Let's get it out. Is going to be John McMillan, who will be speaking with us about pesticide application equipment and treating cycles. Uh, John is a technical service representative with LSI. He's been in wood preservation industry for 43 years. He supports customers with quality control, treating processes, and troubleshooting as issues arise. John identifies trends or problems in customer wood and solution analysis. Before joining LSI 10 years ago, George, uh, John worked at Georgia Pacific, Fiber Wood, and Cox Industries. He attended Sumter Technical College studying civil engineering. I would also, before John starts, like to say that poll question number two will be following uh, John's presentation. Thank you, John. Thank you, Grady. Um, uh, my agenda, we're gonna talk about steps of a treating cycle, what happens during each step, equipment that is used, measurements necessary in press treating, gross injection versus net, treating data, QC requirements, calculated, calculations and conversions. Oops. John, I can't hear you. I was just asking, I'm not sure how to advance this. Oh, never mind. You're advancing. Well, oh, hold on. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So when we talk about trading cycles, one of the things that the main four that I see out there are what you would call full sell. That's where you pull a very high vacuum over 22 inches. A modified full sell is anything less than 22 inches. Lowry is something used uh, some in this industry. It's where there's no vacuum. You just fill the cylinder. And rooping is actually one where you add air pressure and you're filling with a transfer pump. And if you look at the bottom of this graphic, you'll see the gallons per cubic foot net. And you can see the reason the more air you leave in wood, the more, uh, the less gallons a cube you're going to end up with. This can be an advantage for freight. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you would go for um, different processes. Uh, some are just getting more production out. Uh, some are if you're drying after treatment, uh, different things like that. You switch to the next. There we go. So regardless of whatever process you have, I think most of us have seen this graphic where it shows where we have an initial vacuum. When we get to that set point in time, we fill the cylinder and maintain a vacuum. We raise pressure, we maintain that pressure for, uh, usually it's for a flow rate or a, an injection rate. When we meet that criteria, we have a release pressure that can vary in time based on process and equipment. We empty the cylinder, uh, then we have a final vacuum. Uh, then we drain the cylinder. Uh, with treating plants that um, Frank Nessian Engineering has designed and put in, we can strip under final vacuum. There are advantages to this. And I always uh, like to point out, if you notice initial vacuum and final are in green, that's because they work hand in hand as far as how much uptake, how, how much uh, kickback you're going to get in final vacuum. and uh, it all is relative to penetration and retention. Next slide, please. This is a little busy, but this is something I did for a new customer when I first came to work for uh, Arch Lanza. And what I want everybody to look at mainly is if you look at the description, which is in blue, and you go to the right, the results of the steps or the comments. Uh, this was a new treater. They hadn't treated a lot of wood before. And so I was making something up that they could see what pumps would be on, what valves would be working, uh, and things like that. It's going to be different for every plant. Uh, there's uh, many different kinds of setups out there. Some use vacuum pumps with air pressure to blow back. Some use transfer pumps, all that. But when you look at initial vacuum, you're basically creating a vacuum in the cylinder and you control it for a specific time. Uh, this step controls vacuum in the cylinder to a desired set point. When you're filling the cylinder, you want to maintain that vacuum on the cylinder while filling. One of the reasons, the main reason is if you start dropping vacuum significantly, what will end up happening is the bottom of your charge will treat different than the top. Um, in other words, if you're treating full cell and you drop five or six inches of vacuum, uh, you're starting to treat the top part of your uh, wood more modified where the bottom portion of the charge is uh, treating full cell. When we look at atmospheric absorption, that is a delay. A lot of people are on 0.1 minutes or whatever that low number is. It allows wood to absorb solution before inducing pressure, but there's two things that, can, that it can help you with by increasing time. If you have an air pr pressure problem in your plant and not enough volume, by increasing that time, you have a lot of valves and different things happening when you switch over from fill and then you go into pressure. Uh, valves closing, valves opening. Sometimes by having that delay, what you will end up doing is allow the air volume to catch up so you don't have a hard air because a valve can't open. 
The other thing that is an advantage is uh, sometimes with some of these hard to treat meals, uh, having an increased atmospheric absorption, uh, you can get better penetration. I'll talk about that later. Pressure, basically what you're doing with pressure is it's all about penetration. Uh, usually plants will have an injection rate uh, in gallons or pounds per cubic foot, or they might have a flow rate that is a low number. So if you have wood that has a lot of heartwood and it will never meet injection, it will step on flow for time reasons. Uh, as you can see in the right side, there are four criteria. You have a minimum maximum time for the treat right plants, flow in gallons or pounds. Uh, the minimum maximum pound, I want to mention that minimum time, whatever that number is, it does not matter what your injection or flow rate is. Treat right will not step until it hits that minimum time. It won't look at those values. Uh, when you're in release pressure, some plants that treat more modif more full cell and have little air in the cylinder, they can have somewhat of a slower pressure release time due to the, some of the problems we have with us uh, dropping pressure fast. If there's a lot of air that's being uh, being compressed under the pressure process, when you release all that uh, pressure the air expands pretty rapidly and it can cause the cells to aspirate as Gian mentioned earlier. Um, there's, and what will end up happening is it would have come out, you know, the regular way, drip free or fairly drip free, 45 minutes to an hour later when the cells start acclimating to atmospheric pressure, <laughs> you'll start dripping everywhere. So it's just something to keep in mind about. Blowback, that can be done with a vacuum pump where it can use air pressure or there can be transfer pumps. That's just basically moving all excess solution from the cylinder back to the work tank. Final vacuum, that is basically you create a vacuum on the cylinder and uh, strip pumps under uh, treat right systems will strip the uh, about every five minutes. Uh, solution out of the cylinder so when the uh, vacuum is done you don't have to have as long a drain but the vacuum works very if you're treating very modified your final vacuum is normally quite long because you got to give it time for the air to expand and push that out I hear some people use in, uh, in our industry say that vacuum is sucking the solution out well, it's not. I don't know whether y'all remember science class, but when you take a vacuum on regular water, ambient temperatures, what happens is the air molecules in the water will expand and it looks like the water is boiling even though it's at ambient temperature. Same thing happens in final vacuum. What ends up happening is as you pull vacuum, the air that's in the wood expands and pushes excess solution out and like I said, initial and final work hand in hand, depending on how much air you leave in the wood, is how much you're going to push out. And, and I always use the word consistent. It doesn't matter what part of this process, always be consistent. Uh, then you have final drain and end of charge, and they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, change slide, please. Oh, back a couple. I don't know John, what happened. Control. Just use your back arrow. Oh. There you go. Sweet. Thank you. You're so welcome. when we're when we're talking about the treating process explain, I'm just getting crazy with these arrows now. Just give me a second. So when we talk about treated process, uh, you know, if you need to change it, you need to be slow and methodical because if you start changing a lot of things at once, you don't know whether the result is from one or a combination of. Everybody treating wood is as different as all the plants based on preservative, uh, the wood you buy, the equipment you have, but most plants are based on managers, owners, Production times, you need more 
wood going out the gate. You need more uh, wood being processed. Are you worried about freight? Do you need lighter wood? Uh, are you drying after treatment? Those are some of the things. When we talk about, um, but regardless of what the process is, you need to make sure AWPH standards are met for penetration and retention, no matter what the preservative is. Vacuum and initial vacuum, they work together. That determines the gallons of solution per cubic foot retained. And that's based on what I said earlier with the amount of air you're leaving in wood. Some people will leave air uh, charges in vacuum longer than they normally do, and they do get somewhat kicked back if you have a treat right system and you leave it in longer and your strip pump strips and immediately cuts off, chances are you're not doing anything else. You're not pulling anything else out of the wood. That difference is just the surface tension of the vacuum in the cylinder that's pulled the level up over the probe and then you just push it down below it. Um, atmospheric absorption, we do. Uh, discussed all that basically um, one of the things you can do is like sawmills do some like us they need to move more wood through their product uh, through their plants and one of the things they do is they go to high temps now if they don't manage their wet bulb what ends up happening with managing a wet bulb the heat air is very moist what's in the wood is hot same temperature very moist so you don't get any kind of aspiration with the wood cells if you do not manage the wet bulb then it's very dry hot air moist hot air inside the wood and the cells will aspirate like john showed you the problem is is when you go to treat this wood you can't get penetration it's like treating concrete some people will go an hour to or so in pressure. There has been some success with atmospheric absorption. If you leave it in there about three, five minutes, the, what we believe is happening is the vacuum that's inside the wood is slowly migrating solution under migra, uh, atmospheric absorption to where it unaspirates enough of the wood cells so you can get uh, penetration. When we talk about pressure, there's four criteria. There's minimum time, maximum time, injection rate, and flow rate. If you read all these, that basically minimum time, the value has to be long enough normally so you make sure that if you reach flow rate or injection, you're in pressure long enough to ensure you have penetration. What's interesting in manual plants, they will calculate how many gallons they need to push in so they push in that much, they look for a difference in their tank height and they know they're done. Uh, with a computer plant with these four criteria, it helps you uh, treat a little bit more efficient. Uh, I, I don't know whether I'm not bashing on the manual plants, but it uh, helps control how many gallons per cube you're leaving in the wood. Uh, maximum time is like if you've had mad injection or flow rates, it will step when it hits that time. The injection rate is normally a gallons uh, or pounds per uh, cubic foot that is set, and it's usually historical reasons that you have these numbers, uh, and it's all about penetration. Uh, flow rate, like I said before, is set there. If you have wood with a lot more heartwood and you will never meet injection, it will step on flow rate. Blowback, or it can be either, a, a, like I say, a drain pump, a transfer pump or using air pressure with blowback, our final drain or end of charge is pretty much self explanatory. Excuse me, John, we have a question. So, measurements you need. John, can sure. you hear me? We have a question yes. from the audience on the last slide. Okay. Does not, does not the treating process chemical concentrate change by both the season of the wood and dryness? Well, it can, uh, and I'm glad somebody brought that up because, so if wood is a lot more dry, well, so ideally what you wanna do is you wanna have wood 
right around 19, 20% for uh, residential plants. But when you're talking about uh, industrial plants, treating with CCA, larger wood, that number is somewhere around 25%, give or take, depending on the plant. So when you get start getting below 19 or 20%, what happens is that 19 to 20% is locked in the cell walls. And what happens is if you get down, let's say you're around five to 10%, what ends up happening, if you ever treated a charge and all of a sudden your wood retention is a lot higher than it normally is. Well, what happens is when you start treating is those gallons uh, per cubic foot are not only in the cells, they're absorbing in the cell walls, and under final vacuum, you don't get that kickback you normally do because it's locked in where normally moisture is. Um, when you have wood too dry too, it's actually harder to treat. When uh, Gian was talking about bulk flow, has anyone ever taken a uh, sponge that's really dry, stuck it in water, bring it out? It's still fairly dry, it's absorbed little, but if that same sponge is wet and you stick it in water and bring it out, it's absorbed quite a bit more. When we talk about bulk flow, um, I know Gary Kellum and even Randy Bailey's has showed me uh, uh, information from the 30s and 40s that they have found that if wood is too dry, you do not get good penetration. It needs to be residential, right around that 20% range uh, for uh, industrial. I've seen people go 25, 30, and a little bit, but above the penetration criteria is a little bit different but you basically get that bulk flow and you get better penetration but yes i'm sorry to go into too much detail but yes um, dryness of wood that's why uh, resident some plants will segregate wood based on uh, moisture content for that reason the question was asked thank you so when you're talking about measurements, you need in pressure treatment of wood. Uh, basically, we need the beginning tank height, which is usually after the mix, it's full. That uh, We need the cylinder full after it's filled. We need the end of pressure. And then at the end of pressure, we need final tank readings. The reason being is we get a net retention, or, or net injection rather, from the beginning and ending tank readings, that's how much many gallons of cube you have left in the wood. When you look at gross injection, when you look at cylinder full versus end of pressure, that is you when you subtract the two, that is how much uh, solution you are getting out of the wood in final vacuum. This is a, a good number to follow because sometimes you can tell whether the wood is treated right. It could be that there's a lot of heart is the difference. But if you know that you're seeing a number between gross and net uh, on a regular basis, it's, uh, you know, you kind of understand when you treat a chart and you see that number differ. It's kind of like a small red flag to when you're going to check the wood for penetration that there could be an issue. This is just a quick, why is, it, why is gross versus net uh, important? How does initial vacuum affect this? Does increasing final vacuum time change this? Is the difference consistent? Different change for each preset? So when you look at a graphic on the bottom, when you're looking at the majority of that graphic, I would have to say that I do know it's a modified cycle and there's a big difference between gross and net injection. When you look at the gross toward the right and you're seeing those numbers closer, they're treating those charges more full cell. And those are mainly timber charges that they pull more of a vacuum, higher vacuum, so they're not getting as much kickback. So when we talk about how does initial vacuum affect, affect this, it's like I've said, the more air you leave in the wood, the more kickback you're gonna get at, and you'll get a big difference between uh, net and gross injection. And uh, if you're drying after treatment, uh, this is something to look at. Uh, having less of a net gallons per cube, your drying times will be less. Uh, 
but also remember, no matter what your process, you got to meet AWPA requirements. Um, and so this is a treat right um, charge report. You need to know the numbers of your manual plant. Normally, these numbers are handwritten with a similar uh, layout. <clears throat> When we look at tank measurements, and we're looking in gross injection versus net, on this particular charge, 463 gallons, you're basically getting the difference between vacuum fill and the end of pressure. And then you're getting initial vacuum, which is 20 feet, and the end of charge, 16.6, is where these numbers are coming up from. And like I say, if you know these numbers, it really helps you with understanding uh, retention and penetration. Uh, if you're pulling out too much or not pulling enough, that sort of thing. When we're looking at this charge data, we have solution concentration, calculated pounds, uh, net injection. We got a calculated retention, please remember, for that number is is does not taking into account how much heartwood you have in a charge. So if it's below minimum, uh, uh, it could be that there's just a lot of heartwood in that charge. As you can see, the target assay is 0.06. If we're looking at a CCA charge, it'd be very similar, but obviously solution, calculated pounds, all that would be a little different. When you want to calculate the pounds used, it's gallons times weight per gallon times solution percent equals chemical pounds used. Uh, I always like to use for uh, CCA, it's 8.5 pounds per gallon. Copper-based products is about 8.4. You can see this number is not exact, so that number is actually uh, different than the 8.4, but this gives you a general idea. If you take the total gallons used, times 8.4 pounds per gallon, you get pounds of solution. You multiply that times your solution percent. Now keep in mind when you see 0.18 and a percent sign, that's 0 0.0018, and it gives you pounds per chemical used. Uh, this is something that uh, I think everyone needs to understand and know. It will help you uh, understand uh, treating consistencies or you might find out there's a problem with the charge before you end it. Especially with computer-based um, treatments, if you know there's a problem with a particular part of the process, you can go back and redo it um, if you understand these numbers and uh, you find out that something's gone wrong during the charge. When we talk about QC, uh, these are out of the manual standard practice for copper azol. Uh, when you look at it, lumber and timbers, they talk about 20 cores from every charge. Uh, so many borings, uh, they need to pass um, uh, an assay zone as far as penetration. They need to make, meet retention. Uh, <clears throat> the first part, when we're talking about XRF analyzers, uh, one thing that you need to make sure you do, and you can get a known sample from your uh, sales rep, that you need to be checking your XRF machine, whether that's an old Asoma, whether it's an Oxford, whether new Hitachis, a Rigaku. That's the only way you know whether your XRF is analyzing correctly is with a known sample. The nature of the wood sample is that it will absorb ambient. Uh, moisture <clears throat> if you do not have it in uh, uh, some sort of desiccant. Um, so if you start noticing, like on a wood sample, that you're starting to read a little bit low on wood, I would dry your wood sample a little bit, see if it goes right back up. Uh, solution, we don't normally see the issues we see with the known wood samples or wood samples in general. When you're uh, analyzing your wood samples after you core wood, uh, make sure if you f for some reason feel like with everything you've seen during the charge, 
if you feel like the wood analysis is not right, one of the things you can do is try to dry that wood a sl little bit longer. If you see your wood retention go up, then uh, the, the moisture in the wood sample will cause the um, retention to show lower. And also when it comes to micronized uh, solution, Whatever you do with QC, no matter what the preserver, but especially micronized, because it's not a true solution, we have to have agitation in the tanks. Make sure that whatever you do, you're doing the same thing every time. And whether it's right or wrong is the best way I know to explain it. You're coming up with a consistent number, so you know that if my solution's coming out this, I know my wood retention is gonna be this. One problem I see when I go into plants and you observe, sometimes people will take a solution, uh, micronized, and uh, the guy will get distracted and he won't analyze it right away and it might sit there a minute or two. Well, it will slowly, the copper particles will slowly migrate to the bottom. And as they pour that solution off, it will actually analyze lower because uh, copper is not in the true solution. Some people will take a sample bottle and they will shake it up real good before each one. Whatever you do, just make sure you're consistent with it. Uh, when we talk about CCA, and you can see here, one of the things I wanted to point out, not a whole lot of people I don't know are treating 0.25 anymore. There's quite a few post people and other treating 4.0 all the way up to two and a half pounds. If you'll notice that there are minimum component retentions, and then there's a maximum and uh, minimum for copper, chrome, and arsenic. What's interesting about the chemistry of what happens with CCA, especially in the summertime, if you'll notice that uh, for like 4.0, uh, you have a minimum copper, uh, 0 0.067, uh, 6 O's 0.1, 8 O's 0.14, that copper per cubic foot can actually show low because what ends up happening is it's, well, it'll show fine there. Excuse me, I'm getting myself mixed up. It'll show fine in wood, but in your solution, it will show a lower minimum. Well, that's the effect of copper reacting with the wood uh, a little bit quicker than the chrome and arsenic. What ends up happening is there's an equilibrium, even though it's lower, uh, it will still show fine in wood because with in the middle of the summer in the deep south, you will get more uh, copper staying in the wood than in the winter. Converting pounds to gallons, like I said, a gallon of CCA preservative weighs approximately 8.5 pounds. Copper azol preserver is about 8.4. So if I'm having my gallons are in pounds, I can know how many gallons per cubic feet I want in retention. And this is a, a simple math that a lot of manual plants will use to come up with how many gallons total they need for treating a charge per cubic foot. So if I'm looking for a desired um, uh, I want to know how many pounds of solution required for a particular retention, and this works for uh, any preservative. If I'm looking at 0.05 pounds per cubic foot divided by 0 0.002, I come up with 25 pounds of solution. So uh, 0 0.002 times 25 pounds is uh, 0 0.05 pounds per cubic foot. What this helps you with, let's say, you have, uh, you're treating the same thing all the time. I know if I'm at 0.2%, I'm gonna reach my 0.05. That obviously this is an older uh, presentation, it's 0.06 now. But if you're treating something new that you've never treated and you're treating to a particular retention, you can use this simple formula to um, somehow, sometimes to help you understand uh, where you need to be as far as the amount of gallons net you need to be or gross uh, to treat that wood properly. Sometimes what people will do is they will treat the refusal that first time, treating something new to make sure they don't fail it, and then they slowly uh, start backing off um, uh, the injection or flow rate 
to make to dial that in. So calculate sluice and injection, that's the gallons per cubic foot times total cubic foot of wood in the cylinder. So like I said, if I normally leave 2.98 gallons per cubic foot, and I'm treating this many cubic foot in that charge, then I need to move 2,062 gallons into uh, the wood <coughs> through the charge. Gross versus net. So one of the things people will look at if they know my desired net is going to be 2.98 gallons per cube, my gross is actually going to be higher than that. Based on time under pressure, gross injection and flow rate required to get necessary penetration, desired gross is 3.46 gallons a cube. When I look at the charge report we had earlier, um, I know that the difference between gross versus net that um, well, uh, the beginning of pressure and end of pressure, then my gross injection is 3,364 gallons. When I take that and divide that by my cubic footage, then I'm going to come up with gallons per cubic foot. These are all numbers that, that if you're not following, I would suggest to follow to see how consistent the wood you treat is. Um, I know that uh, the goal is to try to separate out like items. Uh, that is not always the case. We're going to have uh, grocery lists in there based on sales. Usually when uh, business is slow, that happens more often. When business is really busy, that can happen. But if you can, the goal is to separate out like items so they treat as consistent as possible so your uh, retentions are, are closer to minimum and you're treating efficient, you're getting uh, good penetration. Because when, you're, when you do all that, you are getting consistent cost. And consistent cost when it comes to the guys that are selling this for your plants, it helps them with a number when they're going in to uh, uh, compete so y'all get more business. Um, because if you're all over the place with gross and net injections, even though your retentions are fine, it might be that you're over or under treating uh, and you don't know what your costs are and you could be making uh, on some woods and some not. Quality control, assay, adjust solution and concentration is the main thing people do. If they start seeing their retentions, uh, this is sometimes seasonal. Well, it is seasonal, especially for CCA. You're not getting the reaction with the chrome and the wood, uh, wood sugars and different things. So you'll see a, a, a lower retention. Uh, with CCA, what I used to do many years ago is I would go out a couple of days, three days later and check CCA and it would be fine uh, because the chromium has not bound the arsenic and the copper into the wood yet. And you're squeezing out solution. Um, it's one thing that you can do. Uh, anytime you're trying to treat close to minimum, I, I don't suggest it unless you're doing a ton of QC to understand what every charge is doing, every piece of wood, all that sort of thing. Penetration, adjust time. Uh, and amount of injection. You might uh, find that you can increase your time. You might find that you need to adjust your injection. If you got wood coming out dripping a lot, but you're getting penetration, you're more likely over pressing. I would just slowly back off that pressure injection or time to see if that uh, happens. In house standards, make sure you're using those on your XRF machines uh, regularly. Daily, some people do it uh, more than once a day. Uh, Lonzo requirements are basically AWPA requirements. Uh, one thing you'll find about third party inspection agencies, whether it's TPI, SBIB, uh, AW Williams, they can go and analyze wood at your customer site. And if they're coming up with bad penetrated wood or a problem, that's not always good. Third party inspection, I've always, especially with new operators or anything, I've always asked, why don't you go out and see how your inspection 
uh, agency uh, person is coring wood, how is he spraying the wood, how is he uh, cutting the wood up, and ask questions. Because the more you can be like him with your analysis, your QC procedures, everything, then your numbers are going to be close to his. Because the one thing about third-party inspection, uh, they will pull your stamps. And uh, a lot of customers anymore to ensure they're getting privately treated wood uh, require that AWPA cloverleaf, third-party inspection, uh, insignia, and all that kind of stuff. It's not um, a place you want to go. Excuse me, John, we have a question from the audience. Sure. Sometimes our third party bores fresh treated product. Should that be happening? I normally always ask my third party inspector to bore wood that's out on the charge. What they like to do is AWPA says you need to get a representative sample from that charge. So what happens is, is boring right out the cylinder. Obviously, they can bore a little bit out of every pack. Sure, with copper-based products, <clears throat> you can squeeze out some solution. The amounts are minute. But if you're treating close, if you got a lot of QC happening and you understand you're treating close to minimum, uh, yes, you can make a difference. Uh, I've always asked to bore wood that's out on the yard. Uh, the problem is if you're not marking the packs well enough, they can't find enough wood. They don't like to bore just one pack. They like to bore more than that. So it could be that, you know, you have charges set out from a couple of days ago. Most of the time when they come in, sometimes they'll let you know. A lot of times they won't. Uh, but I can see, well, the, you can look at this twofold also. If you're boring straight out the cylinder, is he seeing similar numbers you are? If that's the case, if you're going out a day or two later and you're reboring the same charge and you're seeing a number slightly with copper-based products, it'll be very slightly. With CCA, you can see a little bit of difference based on solution strain in gallons a cube. But if you're seeing a difference, your third party inspection there. They are like the people overseeing, making sure you're training right, but they're also a wealth of information. And if you work with them and you can prove that you are that you're not, that you're treating above minimum. And it's all, every inspector is going to be different, but um, I guess I went off on a tangent again, but to, to be honest, I don't like inspectors, especially with the copper products, boring right on my drip bed. I'd rather have them bore wood that's already out. It's been there for a day or two. Thank you. Oopsie. And that's all I got. Any other questions? Okay, there being no questions, Sarah, let's pull up question number two. Okay, we got 100% and everyone in the audience is correct. All right. There we go. John, you're a genius teacher there. Okay, our next and final speaker before lunch. Is uh, David Jones from uh, Timber Products, everybody knows David. Uh, there will be a third poll question following David's presentation, so don't run off to lunch till you can answer that. 
David will be talking about the elements of a successful implant QC program, which uh, ties in with what John was just talking about. David is a training division manager for Timber Products Inspection. Before he accepted that position in April of 2021, he served as the Director of Project Services, BMI, for six years. He also was the Associate professor, professor and Extension Specialist, Forest Products, at Mississippi State University. David received, received his PhD in Forestry and Wood Science from the University of Georgia, his uh, MSF in Forestry from Stephen F. Austin State University, and his BS in Forest Resources from Clemson University. He is a member of several trade professional organizations, including Society of Wood Science and Technology, AWPA, International Association of Wood Anatomists, and the North American Wholesale Lumber Association. David, it's all yours. David, you might right. need to turn on your yeah. mic. Yeah, got it turned on now. Um, so, as as Grady said, I am um, the the treating director at, at Timber Products Inspection. Um, as John was saying earlier, I'm, I'm while I'm not the inspector that may come out to your facility, I am the person that finalizes the reports. Uh, according to the AWPA standards. So today I'm going to walk through kind of our procedures, kind of what a good procedure in the uh, in a facility would be, along with what the standards are, um, what methods we use, and what equipment uh, you need to do the inspections. So the the purpose of sampling. Is, is very basic is to demonstrate that the product meets the specifications uh, both set forth by the manufacturer but also by um, the AWPA standards which ultimately dictates how well a product has to be treated. Um, it's also to control the process. Finally it's uh, to manage the resources so ultimately a lot of uh, facilities look at this as a way to make sure that they're not uh, expending too much uh, chemical, which in turn means expending too much money uh, on treating the material. And finally, for better or for worse, it's required under all the rules and regulations associated with it. We've, we've heard that time and time again this morning. So what are the sampling standards? Well, they're they're really really detailed. For those of you that uh, that are lucky enough to have a book, let me grab my book. You can see it in a little picture of my my ugly bearded face here. Um, this is the 2020 Book of Standards. It's uh, approximately 500, well 672 pages of standards. While not all of those standards will actually apply to your individual facility because Many of them have to do with the um, rules of doing the analysis uh, by the third party or by the uh, supplier. There are a lot of rules that, that do apply to you. Um, the very first one is U1, which is user specification for treated wood. It goes into detail of uh, what the uh, retentions, what the uses are for the material, and, and often. You hear folks talk about 3B and 4A. Um, really, it's it's the rules that, that dictate what can be used for above ground, what can be used for uh, ground contact, different areas, different regions. It really lays out where and how uh, wood can be utilized. T1 follows up with that, which is the processing and treatment standard, which is ultimately what you operate under and how materials are treated and what the requirements are associated with that. Um, there are a ton of A standards, which are the analysis methods um, for analyzing the treated wood to make sure it does meet the standard. You've got M2, which is the standard for inspection. 
and preservative treated products for industrial use. So CCA often falls under the industrial use uh, because of the labeling. So M2 standard does apply to that. You've then got M3 for those of you that treat other preservatives um, that, that goes into the industrial use and the quality control. And then you've got M25, which is the from this slide, thanks to my not catching it, the standar for quality control and inspection of preservative treated products. It's supposed to be standard, but y'all can laugh at me for that. I'm I'm good with that. So let's talk about sampling equipment because I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Because when your inspector comes in, kind of want to be talking the same the same language here. Um, right under the word sampling, you'll see a boring bit. Um, you know, when I learned it forever ago, that was an increment boring bit because you were taking an increment four out of a tree. Obviously, in uh, what we're doing, we're taking samples out of out of boards, um, so we often just call it a boring bit. The little item under the bit itself is an extraction uh, spoon. It allows you to slide in under the uh, the increment core and uh, break it free from the the material you're sampling and extract it out of the bit. Um, the picture just below the uh, word equipment is an adapter that allows you to use an electric or hydraulic drill to hold that that bit in place and use it to go into the wood. Once the cores are are removed, they're placed in in the aluminum tray that you see in the upper right hand part of the presentation. Um, that plate has different lines on it and it tells you where to cut based on the assay zones found in the AWPA standards. It also uh, is has 10 on one side and 10 on the other. So the 20 cores that you have to sample are based on the uh, requirements. As you see in the bottom left hand corner, you can see we've got the cores there have changed color and they have changed color. And in this instance, it's Southern Pine. And we've got the chemical in the uh, bottom center there, which is the um, A and B solution, which we spray onto the increment cores to indicate heartwood so that we make sure that if heartwood is supposed to be excluded from the assay zone, that it is properly excluded. And then on the bottom right, we have um, the rubionic acid that we use um, to determine copper penetration on the samples. Now we use uh, rubionic acid instead of chrome azrol, uh, primarily because you've got a little more time to read it. We're not going to go into great detail on that, but it's very important if um, your inspection agency is using a different chemical for the measure of penetration that you have some of that on hand to make sure you're comparing apples to apples in case you get a different result. Excuse me, David. Yes. We have a question from this. How can we get the extractor that goes with the drill? Um, all you have to do is uh, you can contact you know, whoever you're, you're getting your materials from. The vast majority of folks are buying their supplies from, from us or ordering them through um, Lanza. All you, you have to do is, is let us know you'd like to buy. We, we keep them in stock. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a, an easy thing to do. Just, just you know, you'll have my contact information. Just let me know and I can put you in contact with somebody that you can order those from. Thank you. Yep. Um, one of the important things when doing sampling, and this is one that I run into um, from an issue standpoint, is there, a mill may not be doing a systematic sampling method. In this case, um, each one of those black dots represents a place that a um, 
inspector would sample, they would find a pack of material, and then they would sample every other board. Usually we go to the left or right and center of that. That way it just, when a bundle of, uh, or pack of lumber sits in a home center, you just don't have this straight line of holes in there. And so it kind of breaks the pattern up. But whatever pattern your inspector is using, that should be the pattern that you utilize to sample. That way you're mimicking what your third party is doing. And as was discussed earlier, sometimes when our inspector shows up on site, there may only be three packs of material for a charge to sample. And so we will spread out the 20 cores over those three packs. If there's five, if there's 10, we'll spread those out. Um, we don't have the benefit of always having a complete charge to sample, um, but when it is available for sample, we try to take as many samples from different uh, packs of material as possible. The big thing is you don't want to introduce bias by cherry picking your samples for your QC internal to the mill. You want to say, hey, I'm going to take three or five or two samples per pack of material and it's always going to start with the second board or the third board and take it that way that way there's no possibility that you're you're picking material that is treated better than others um, with that said just to bring it up it's best not to sample the boards on top or bottom of a pack because they generally have more surface area that's exposed and they would give you a disproportionate uh, measure of, of penetration and retention relative to material that's found um, further down in the pack. So before you take the first sample, what you need to know is what your AWPA standard is for that particular product, which is based on both the chemical that's being utilized and also the size of the material. Once you know that, then you can take your samples. You can determine uh, where the heartwood is. That's uh, detailed in A49. And then you can determine the penetration, which is found in a lot of different standards based on the, um, the chemical that's being utilized at the time. Again, these particular increment bores that are on, or cores that are on the tray have not had any indicator of any kind sprayed on them. Um, not all preservative treatments have a very distinct color to them, and therefore that's why we don't use color by itself as an indicator. We actually use chemicals to make the determination of penetration. Again, um, here are the cores after they've been sprayed um, with heartwood indicator and with um, the copper indicator. And you can see the, the orange red color, particularly in the cores where the, the um, utility knife is pointing down. You can see that that changes there. You wouldn't want to include that heartwood in because heartwood, as previously was discussed, does not allow liquid flow and therefore would not be penetrated by the chemical and adding that in would give you a lower result than what you actually have associated with it. so it's very important to follow that and it's important to, to check with your inspector of what an inspector does with that particular core because some inspectors majority of inspectors will replace that that sample that has the heartwood in the assay zone with, with a sample that does not have heartwood in it and has penetration. Again, based on the regulation, the most pores you can have fail penetration is four per 20. And then you're still okay and have 80% or 80% uh, appropriate penetration. If you have five, then the inspector is going to fail um, that material for penetration. 
So let's talk about analysis a little bit here. There's a lot of different ways to prepare material for analysis. Um, and I've seen a little bit of everything. Um, once you take those cores, generally the best practice is to dry them a little bit, particularly if they're, they're damp, and then use a method to grind them down to a fine powder. Now, the most reliable method to doing that under grinders is the Wiley mill, the Wiley mini mill. Um, that is because it has a screen in place that will grind the material down to the, the particular size um, that needs to be utilized where you can collect it. Um, it's a very easy thing to, to utilize. You can see there's a glass plate on the front so that you can see if there's material still inside of the, the grinder. We have seen mills that use a, a flour mill, a commercial flour mill that, that can grind material in. Again, you don't have a great deal of control over particle size that comes out of there. And finally, we, we have had a few mills that use coffee grinders to grind material. Again, you have to set up, particularly for a, a coffee grinder, a, a method that gives you a consistent material to um, put into place. Once the material is ground, again, because it's been exposed to air and moisture, you have to dry it down. You want to remove all of the moisture associated with it. Um, the best way to, you, to do it is to use a laboratory convection oven. Um, because they are consistent in temperature, generally don't have hot and cold spots within them and give you more consistent results, but you don't necessarily have to have one. Um, you can use a kitchen counter uh, convection oven or a, um, an oven oven in that place. You just have to bring the temperature up to at least 100 degrees C, uh, preferably 103 degrees C, which is a little more than 212 degrees. Um, just so you know, that's the magic number where water boils and what you're trying to do is get all of the bound, free and bound water within that wood sample to come out so that it doesn't interact with um, the analytical method. You can use a microwave to do the same thing. Here's where I will warn you. I can't use a microwave. I, I got bad luck. I'll be honest with you. Every time I've ever put a wood sample in a microwave to dry it out, I catch it on fire. Nobody's ever happy about the microwave smelling like burnt pine. So I just stay away from the microwave now. Better use oven, just say it. Um, one thing that, that you do need is, is several other uh, miscellaneous items. You need sample pans um, to catch and hold the dust and place the dust into the ovens because you know if you just put the dust in the oven it's not going to help you out it'll just fall to the bottom um, it's good to have a calibrated thermometer for your oven so that you know for sure that you're getting above the boiling point of water um, when you're drying because if you're not if you never get above the boiling point of water You'll never get all of the moisture out of the sample. And for the Asoma instruments, the XRF machines, you need to have a press with a torque wrench so that you know that you're getting the wood fiber packed down in the sample cup uh, to the, uh, the appropriate uh, pounds per cubic foot. Now, there are several different types of machine, these are the, these are the big four. Um, you've got the Asoma, which is the older uh, models. Um, these are often the ones that we find uh, in mills uh, because many of the mills have held on to these uh, for a very long time. They're very reliable, tend to uh, hold up very well in the mill environment. We've got an Oxford, um, haven't been really any new um, material or instruments from them because they were bought by um, Hitachi 
again, each one of these has its you know benefits and its downsides. You have to make the determination which one's right for your facility. And then of course you've got the lovely Ragaku, which again is a is a good instrument. Um, it's important to know that uh, the proper pronunciation is Ragaku because if you try to order samples and you say it wrong like I used to, um, people just look at you and laugh. And so um, you know, try to be familiar with how each one is, is pronounced. But each one of these works off the same basic principle where they use um, X-ray technology to uh, measure the copper that's is in the samples, and that's why it's so important to have the moisture content appropriate in the samples so that you don't get an interaction between the X-ray and the water molecules. You want it to purely interact with the, with the copper or the other chemicals um, that are in the material. We can use these for, for other, other materials also. Um, just as a side note on this, the wood industry relies on these instruments, but so do pharmaceutical companies, um, people that do soil analysis, the oil industry. So these, these particular instruments are used in, in a broad array of places. They're not just uh, instruments for the wood industry. So each one of those instruments has to be calibrated. Um, and the way that you calibrate it is you get a known sample from, you can get known samples both from your chemical manufacturer, chemical sales, you can get um, samples from your third party often. Um, and it, it is a good idea to get samples periodically from your third party to make sure that you're matching up with what they have. Um, once the calibration is created, it should be checked daily to make sure that there's not drift in the machine. And that is by maintaining and keeping the standards that we talked about earlier. Um, we have standards that are created for CCA and HENA, um, but most of those have, have been depleted. Um, we, we are working on getting more standards together for, for that, but often the ones that um, we see right now are chemical suppliers who create their own standards and create them in such a way that, that they know that the uh, standard is reliable and, and matches up with known values. Um, AW, AWPA should have new copper standards come out. We just discussed it last week. The standards should be ready sometime in the beginning of, of next year so that um, they can be uh, utilized too. Um, again, once it's calibrated, you you maintain your standards and then you go and follow up with verification and make sure that um, proper steps are taken. In the AWPA standards, there are, are two requirements um, that that are dictated. One is the M3, if you fall under the M3 requirements. Um, where you have to do a verification, but most of the mills facilities will have to meet the M25 standard, which is um, daily calibrations um, or verifications of the instruments to make sure that the instrument has not moved um, out of spec. And this, this is super important for you as a facility. You want to be sure that your instrument is verified every day, because if it Let's say there, there are two possible outcomes here. Let's say that the instrument is drifted and is giving you low results. If it's giving you low results, then you're using more chemical than you should be using, right? Because you will adjust your process so that you're, you're utilizing more chemical. On the, downs, on the other side of it, if your instrument is drifted upward saying you're using more chemical, then it may be, may be found out by your third party that you're not putting enough chemical into or preservative into the wood itself, therefore not meeting the minimum requirements set out by AWPA. Now, we talked about it 
a little bit, the calibrations and verifications. You can do that in, in partnership with your third party inspection agencies, or you can utilize others um, to do it basically following the requirements from AWPA. Um, for those that are doing poles, you may do that with the Wood Quality Control Incorporated, um, particularly if you're doing poles and coral songs. So let's talk about inspection agencies a little bit. Um, inspection agencies are accredited. They have to be at least accredited by ALSC and or IAS, uh, meaning that they're ISO certified to do inspections. Um, all inspection agencies have to be third parties. That means that they have to be independent both from you as a facility and independent from the manufacturers of the chemical so that they can give an unbiased opinion of where you fall at. And inspection agencies generally follow, follow programs. The ALSC, which is the American Lumber Standards Committee, is the most common one. But we also have the ESR, which is done by code um, regulations, ICCES. We can do independent inspections. We can do lot inspections. Um, often we're doing inspections that follow the standards set forth by AWPA, which is uh, 12 inspections. Uh, on site per year minimum. That means that we can actually come in more often than that, but, but generally 12 inspections if everything's okay. Most um, inspection agencies do their own laboratory and will do laboratory services. So as far as internal, internal quality control, your third party agency has the ability to do um, testing to make sure that your processes are in control um, for the material that, that you're treating. Um, the biggest standard that we follow for third party, and this is both for the ALSC system and the ESR system, um, is the M2221. Um, the standard itself is M22. The dash 21 indicates when the standard was adopted. So M22 was adjusted and amended um, in 2020. And in 2021, the new standards came out. So the biggest, the biggest thing that we follow up on is making sure that products meet the minimum retention. Um, and we've got an LCL, which is the lower confidence limit. It is approximately 95% confidence interval of the median of the product, not the mean, but the median. Um, that has been increased slightly over the last year so that it is no longer the uh, lower confidence limit. It's not based on the minimum retention, but is based on the minimum retention plus 5%. Um, so the LCL for um, items that require a retention of 0.15 pounds per cubic foot, the LCL minimum is now actually 0.16 uh, because of that 5% 5, 5 increase in requirement. The LCL is based on the production category, so an above ground material will have a different LCL than a uh, ground contact, and it is calculated for all preservative components. So in the case of, of micronized copper or CCA, each individual component has to meet a minimum LCL. Um, that LCL calculation, which um, is a, a lovely statistical calculation that drives a lot of people crazy, is based on the most recent 20 charges sample. So when an inspector comes in and takes an inspection, let's say the inspector takes five um, samples, the oldest five samples will roll off of the calculation and will be replaced by the newest five um, samples to do the calculation. 
and and so a sample will stay on the calculation until it has become sample 21 at which point it'll fall out not only for um, retention do we have a calculation we also have a calculation for the average percent core conformance again that follows the 20 percent charge uh, rule so charge 21 will roll off of the um, calculation but it is based on the total conforming cores divided by total cores so um, what we do is we calculate that percentage and you have to be above 80 percent of your cores are penetrated appropriately if you fall below that then there are um, repercussions for it which we see in the inspection statuses so a mill starts out in what's known as an initial increase when they're qualifying until they reach the appropriate number of stamp, uh, samples um, if everything checks out the, the lcl is above the required level in the apcc which is the average percent core conformance is above 80 percent then the mill will, will maintain routine status if the lcl or the routine or the apcc falls below the required minimums the mill will move into increased status now a mill can stay in increased status until whatever correction needs to occur either the lcl uh, gets above the minimum or the apc gets above the minimum so long as there are no charges that actually fail minimum retention if a mill is in increased status and during the next inspection which has to occur within two weeks of the report being delivered to the facility if a charge fails then the mill will move into uh, warning status and again a mill can stay in warning status so long as all charges pass the minimum retention requirement um, in the process but if another charge fails minimum retention when the third party comes in then the mill will be placed on disqualification status once a mill has um, uh, reached disqualification status the mill cannot change uh, third party agencies and has to stay with that agency until they get out of disqualification status in order to get out of disqualification status the mill has to treat 20 charges that pass that the third party evaluates so it's a it's a pretty big hill to climb to get requalified if you move into disqualification status um, that does not that also means you will you will lose the ability to tag material under the standards um, that does not mean that there is not a way to tag material because you can have every single charge tested by the third party and tag it but again that's a very big hill to climb um, and and is very costly so here's the LCL report. You'll see the red line there. This is an older report. Um, that red line indicates the minimum LCL. That is that has moved up by five percent um, based on the new regulations. The green line is the calculated LCL for the facility given the time. So if you follow that red triangle down to the bottom, it'll tell you the date that that LCL was applicable. So that would be the day that the inspection happened. The individual blue dots are individual charges that um, were inspected and sampled. If you notice, there's one charge there about um, December of 2017 that obviously had failed uh, retention associated with it. A single charge failing retention, generally, if the LCL is high enough already, will not pull the LCL down far enough to fail, but multiple charges in that range can cause problems. This is a very important note. Over treating a charge when you normally treat close to the minimum can have the same effect as 
under treating a charge because the LCL is measuring your overall ability to maintain control of your process system. So over treating will increase the error associated with the calculation and can decrease your LCL. It's sort of counterintuitive. There have been discussions of how to handle this so that people are not necessarily penalized when they overtreat material, but it's important to know that it does have an impact. Again, we've got these, these different uh, tools and techniques. Your third party should be giving you a report monthly or whenever an inspection occurs. It provides you all of the information to help you understand whether how to correct, not necessarily how to correct, but give you the information so that you can make determinations with internally and with your, your um, chemical supplier so that you stay in conformance with the regulations. Again, going over status levels in a little more detail, um, it's basically uh, green, yellow, red for us. That's, that's the way that we kind of qualify it. You start out in routine status once you're qualified. You stay in that as long as you keep your LCL and your um, penetration above the appropriate point. Um, if you have a deficiency either in penetration or your LCL, you move into, move into increased status and uh, can stay in that status as long as um, it takes to either improve your LCL or APCC, or um, if you fail individual charges, then you will move to the next status. Similarly, going from warning, you can move back up into increased. You cannot go directly back to routine from warning. Um, you can only move up to increased and then the next inspection, if everything's still okay, then you'll move back into routine status. Again, once you're in warning status, it's important to make sure that every single charge you treat passes both penetration and retention so that it does not uh, lead to disqualification. Um, now, there's another standard that must be followed. Um, based on AWPA, and that is the M23 standard. And the M23 standard is basically where the, the third party checks to make sure that all your processes and products are meeting the requirements. So that's making sure that you are keeping records of processing. For those of you on the West Coast, um, that includes your conditioning and incising material, those on, in the, um, on the Eastern side of the world. Um, don't have to worry about incising if they're treating southern pine. Um, we look at temperature, we look at, at steam bath, if there's a steam bath, making sure that the moisture contents are proper. Legible charge numbers, I cannot emphasize this enough. If I can't read the charge number on your material, it is like that material hasn't been treated. Um, and the reason that we approach it that way is because we get in trouble with the American Lumber Standards Committee if a mill has um, illegible um, stamps. So for those of you that don't know, while we come in to do inspections of you, um, ALSC, if you're in the ALSC program, can and will eventually come into your facility. They are not necessarily inspecting you, they are inspecting us as a third party to make sure that we're doing the checks that are appropriate, which then goes back to M23, us making sure you're doing the checks that are appropriate to stay within um, the processes. Similarly to the M22 standard, you can move through a system of um, routine status, uh, routine follow-up, meaning that you had a deficiency in a process group that was not major but needs to be followed up on and made sure that it's corrected before the next inspection or you can immediately go into warning where you've got a, a product group issue where maybe material is mislabeled 
um, or failed material has been sent out the door. In those cases, um, you move immediately to warning, and if that deficiency is not corrected, and it, another deficiency is found in either the process group or the product group, you can be disqualified. And again, that leads to tags being removed um, and not given back until after those items have been handled. And this is just the, the flow um, in that M23 standard. You've got M23 routine, routine follow-up, meaning that there was some sort of deficiency. Um, if a process or product deficiency is found on the second inspection, which runs along the bottom, bottom of this graph, you will move into warning status. Once in warning, if you have any deficiencies at all after that, you will be disqualified. Um, just important to know that this is the flow that we all have to follow um, based on the written standards. Again, these are changes that occurred this year um, before there was a point system and it was possible for, for a facility to um, have deficiencies but not actually increase in uh, status because they never accumulated enough points to move to the next point. In this system, not handling your deficiencies will cause you to um, move up in the, in the status. So now that I've, I've blown through this, um, some of the best advice that I've heard today is whoever your inspection, inspection agency, your third party is, whether it's um, timber products, whether it's SPIB, Bodie, whoever your inspection agency is, work with them and work with the inspector um, to determine the methodology that they are utilizing in your facility to do the inspection and then mimic it as close as you can so that you will get similar results. I cannot promise you that you will always get the exact same results. Wood is a very variable material and because of that, depending on the samples, can make a difference in what the overall retention and, and penetration results are. But if you mimic, mimic the processes that the inspector uses, you will get um, similar enough results that you stay um, in good graces with the AWPA standards. And do not be afraid to reach out to me. You know, that, is, that is my job ultimately Particularly if you're if you're one of our our clients, it's, it, I can answer whatever question you may not necessarily like the answer I give you. I'm not going to lie to you, but um, I'm always willing to work with you and, and answer questions. The only thing that we can't do as a third party is provide you any information on the appropriate way to treat material. That is that is uh, would be a conflict between ourselves and you as us being an oversight agency, but any other questions are, are, are always welcome. If you have any questions right now, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, thank you, David. We appreciate that presentation. Uh, we have a third uh, poll question. The last before lunch. You do not have to maintain any treating records for your treating facility. Okay, Sarah, we're at 100%. We are at 100%. Okay, well, that ends our morning session of the operator seminar. We'll see you in session number two this afternoon. That starts at 1 
p.m. Eastern time. 1 p.m. Eastern. So enjoy your extra lunch time, and we'll see you back in uh, session number two. Thank you. One quick thing, Grady, Grady. as a reminder to everyone. Go ahead, yep, go ahead. One thing we need to remind everyone, they have to log out to the morning session and log back in using the second email they received for the afternoon session. There should be a blue join webinar button. That's how they will log in for the afternoon session at one. Okay, thank you for that reminder. You're welcome. Any other questions before we sign off? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.